Good evening. It is almost 6 p.m. French time. I would like to thank all of you for being here. I think that people will join the room little by little. I would just like to go round our participants to make sure that everybody is here. I can see Charles Personnaires. I can see Hervé Barbaré, Anaïs Aguerre, Antonio Rodriguez, who is missing. I cannot see Jean-Hervé Lorenzi. But I think that he should be joining the room very shortly. Claude, who's here, our first speaker, Jean-Hervé, I can see you now. Is Claude Mollard here in the room? Claude Mollard is not in the room yet. You haven't had any connection problems? Excellent. So if Claude is not here, that's slightly problematic. I just mentioned that I will have to leave at quarter to seven. What I've, what I've got to say is uh, so far removed from your intelligence. No, I am um, unfortunately required to uh, promote another project that I'm working on. This is a book that I've written called La Grande Rupture. <laughs> and uh, it's very far removed from the topic that uh, we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you should be able to buy this book. Laurence Chesnel Dupin is here. So the only person who's not here yet is the first speaker. Oh, yes, I can see Claude Moulard. Good evening, Claude. Good evening. There are a lot of us here. I imagine that people are going to be uh, arriving in the room shortly. You can see uh, Notre Dame of Paris behind us. Yes, it's beautiful. You can see the beautiful sky as well. We have one minute left. We hope that there will be a lot of people running late because we should be, there should be a lot more of us than who we can see at the moment. We will be launching this officially in a couple of minutes, but as you know, our ethics debates are recorded. We have a lot of people that we listen to the sessions afterwards as well. And we also publish aspects after this as well. So anybody not here today will be able to catch up with this later. I think we should start now. It is 6 p.m. on the dot. Thank you very much to all of you who are already here. I would like to welcome Charles Personnaz, the director of the Institut National du Patrimoine and co-organizer of this cycle of ethics debates. Perhaps, Charles Personnaz, uh, traditionally, you are the one who starts by welcoming our participants and speakers. So I would like to hand over to you now in order to welcome everybody here with us in the room. Thank you very much. This is an almost ritual welcome now, as we have developed a real rhythm of meeting up around topics that we consider very important. Today's topic is entitled, Does the know-how of museums have a price? The New Deal in Cultural Engineering. And I hope that this could be our last fully online conference. Perhaps we're going to be able to meet up in conference halls and lecture theatres again soon. This is a topic that is very meaningful for the INP. We do cultural engineering in our field in museums, which is training. We do this in France, I believe, and also overseas with a certain number of countries with whom we work. I think that some lessons we can learn 
from the Institut National du Patrimoine, the French National Heritage Institute, is that first and foremost, all cultural engineering operations need to be strategic. There is a large risk of spreading ourselves too thinly as needs are so large across France and also internationally. We sometimes tend to spread ourselves too thinly, like in other instances as well, and not to maintain a long-term strategy. That is the first comment that I would like to make based on my experience. The second thing, and I think that um, Mr. Hervé Barbaret will not contradict me on this point, we need greater coordination between public stakeholders for cultural engineering so that everybody complies with and, and respects their field of activity, that those who should be operators are operators, organizers organize, regulators need to regulate. Everybody needs to find their role and their place within this, and that is very important. That is the second point, the second lesson we can learn. And the third thing in this question of cultural engineering involves working with people other than ourselves. We are public stakeholders, but we need to work with nonprofits. We need to work with the private sector. We need to meet with lots of different stakeholders that may not be especially developed in France. Sometimes they might be better so in, in other countries, like in Italy, which has excellent um, experience in projecting its cultural engineering. We have a lot of work left to do. I'm going to stop there as I'm not one of the speakers this evening. Just a few introductory comments for you. I would just like to welcome you. Thank you, Icon France and Juliette Raoul Duval for your energy for the implementation of this uh, cycle of events. Thank you very much to all of the speakers, Anna Israel, Anaïs Aguerre, Michel Antoine, Hervé Barbaré, Laurence Chesneau Dupin, Jean Hervé Lorenzo, Lorenzi, Claude Moyard, Antonio Rodriguez, and we are delighted to see you again soon on a non digital platform. And I would now like to hand back over to Juliette for the continuation of this event. Thank you very much, Charles. Yes, I do hope that we will be able to go back to our amazing lecture theatre next time. It is rare to find hybrid forms. We have colleagues joining us internationally, and these platforms uh, do have their inconveniences, but it does allow us to meet together with people from across the globe who would not be able to travel for one or two hours of debate. I'd like to give you a short introduction now. Thank you very much, Charles, for this uh, introduction and for our long-standing cooperation that is very rich now. Dear speakers, thank you for being here. Dear speakers of members of ICOM in France and also internationally, as there's quite a few of you in this virtual room. This is our eighth evening with INP on a topical subject. We are here under the prism of professional ethics with members of ICOM France and international members of ICOM, extending to everybody interested in museums. Today, we are going to tackle a field that is certainly not new, as we will see from the very first presentation. But cultural engineering is an activity that remains in the shadows for a large number of museum professionals. What is it about? What categories of professionals are in charge of it? Who is concerned in my museum? In all countries, even as we, we, we have this pandemic that is forcing us to rethink museums in the world and in our institutions, we need to diversify and increase the source of our own resources and income. When we talk about cultural engineering of museums, we have this in mind 
creating value for our income and our resources. These are specific to us as museum professionals. We're talking about developing our know-how and capacity building. And we are all convinced that museum professionals have skills that are not found in other fields of activity and that we willingly describe as excellent. By saying this, I'm already framing our discussion a little bit. This is a professional approach. What are these skills, this know-how, this intelligence that one acquires or deploys when working in a museum? And how can it be valued outside of that framework, even outside of the museum world? With our friends here today, we're going to discover an overview of this and perhaps develop a, a list or catalog of that. So we're talking about valuing, creating value, which is the right word. It's about highlighting it, but it's also a cinnamon in this case of selling it. I don't want to be provocative this evening as this is quite a delicate issue. Many of our speakers this evening um, to quote one of them says this is almost trivial, but there's a tradition of international cooperation without economic value. At the same time, we believe, and I would like to mention a very important um, aspect here is that economic aspects and dimensions are just as important as the social ones. We mention international cooperation because this is the most emblematic, but we should also remember, and I will mention this later, I've quoted Claude Mollard in my invitation to this debate, that the ambition of the first cultural engineering agency 25 years ago was to set up cultural facilities in all the regions of France as factors of irrigation. We'll talk about the issue of territories later this evening. But clearly, cultural engineering evokes a dimension of openness to the world. And the recent report of the Court of Auditors bears the title International Development of Cultural Engineering and Brands. And of course, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi inevitably comes to mind. Obviously, it's a symbol, a turning point as well. It feeds into passionate discussions well beyond the circle of professionals or that of cultural diplomacy. And it's new for museums, this notion of brands which has emerged with the variations, de derivative products, turnkey exhibitions, co-productions. Consulting services for simple advice to the direct management of a cultural project of varying scope, including management and governance. Also, with the Louvre Abu Dhabi, the ethical issue was concretely placed at the heart of the project around a prerequisite of the virtuous use of income, financing the reserves, work on the collections, etc. There's a before and after to Abu Dhabi, which were mentioned this evening, and we will talk about lots of examples of success the transitional Pompidou centers in Malaga, Brussels and Shanghai, but also Rodin, Picasso, Orsay, and of course, Universe Science, which will also testify this evening to the effects that this can have on the teams, on local teams. All of these actions are part of the combined objectives of generating your own income, which is estimated at between one and 16% and also international and local influence. France is well placed because of the richness and interest of its collections. What's the situation in other countries? What collective work is being done in the international committees of ICOM? We will listen to our colleague from the ICEE. And what place do these activities hold in our international network of ICOM? Are they a lever for the reconstruction of the post-COVID crisis museum? as we've been going in circles since the start of the pandemic. This is the debate that we would like to have today. This is part of um, reopening, a period when we're reopening museums in France and across the world. This is a period of intense reflection on the definition of museum with international questions on the museum system 
this goes beyond the recomposition of museums at the moment. This is about identifying specific skills of museums and the qualifications of their professionals. The Senate committee with um, myself and uh, the Secretary General of ICOM, we are partners within this operation. And before handing over to the first speaker, I would like to remind you that this discussion is translated and is being recorded. Please do leave any comments you like in the chat and we're going to be monitoring that constantly in order to answer any of the questions that you ask us. Claude Muller is our first speaker. Claude Muller is the father of cultural engineering in some senses. So we would like Claude Mollard to start off by defining this term. As Jean-Hervé said, he has to leave at quarter to seven and we would like to give him a quarter of an hour. That's what you need, Jean-Hervé, I think. So, dear Claude, I would like you to please define cultural engineering and at 6.30 I will hand over to Jean-Hervé Lorenzi before handing back over to you Claude Moller after that if you still need to finish your presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for being with us. Over to you Claude. In order to define cultural engineering, we need to define a certain number of circumstances, historical circumstances. I'll mention three. First of all, 1973, the creation of the um, cultural funds. At the time, there was a plan. This was the called the sixth plan. There was a culture commission. I was re reporter of the finance aspect of this commission um, under the Ministry of Finance, and I was working for culture underneath the budget aspect. So I was undoing uh, at nighttime what I was doing at daytime. So I was part of the cultural fund. I was, this was about project management within the culture ministry of France, even between other ministries, because we had finance also from the agricultural ministry, from the ministry of the armies, from national education, and it was all under the prime minister for the interministerial aspect. The second phenomenon, which is not project management, but it's to do with the volume of spending about investment. We spent seven years building the Pompidou Centre and I had to manage 1.3 billion euros and I had to introduce governance methods because we couldn't go beyond the budget and even at the end of the operation, no, nobody knows this, but I gave back 5 million euros to the public purse. So we had 1 billion 37, one point Oh, I'm sorry, 1 billion 37 million we had and we gave back 5 million to the public purse. And this forced us to put in place methods, um, which was the beginnings of cultural engineering. Third factor was the Lang years. Lang arrived in 1980 and I was part of his cabinet and I had a uh, a role because I was managing finance and I was uh, passionate about culture. So together with Lang, we were part of a phenomenon of innovation and energy in the direction of projects. So project management, uh, budget management and energy. This gives us a, a, a cultural policy, which I think ended in 1986 when Francois Diotta arrived, who for reasons that may be on could be understood, asked me to return to the uh, Court of Accounts, which I didn't do. And he, I asked him 
for a mandate to create a cultural engineering agency within the, the, the culture ministry and the ministry with the budget that we had was able in France and in the world to create a real movement of cultural development. Um, I produced a report and I suggested to the ministers that we began an, a mixed, mixed company uh, agency under the Ministry of Culture. Robert Lyon, who was the director of the, the of the Caisse des Comptes, uh, was in agreement with this, but uh, there was uh, the the minister wasn't in, in agreement. But so I created it under the Cour the Cour des Comptes, um, and it, this was where so, uh, cultural engineering began. But um, the name was not very popular with a number of people in. Jack, Jack, Lang, Jack Lang said to me, if you want to do that project, go, go for it. We, after two years, were handling 100 projects in the region, in the regions of France and also abroad. So we were um, supporting, we, we were a, a private agency that was selling services to cultural institutions and local authorities and private companies. One of my first uh, first clients was somebody who wanted to create a foundation for contemporary art. So we sold services to support the development of cultural projects, uh, primarily public services that were decentralized, but even national, uh, even at a national level. And it's true that now I find really very strange that museums are now starting to do cultural engineering. So in the second part of what I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about the way in, in, in which the um, Arab World Institute, where I work now, is involved in this approach. But in order to respond and answer your question specifically, cultural engineering is, is what um, is the capacity to bring optimal solutions in terms of quality, cost, and timelines, um, quality, cost, and timelines. We implemented this at the Pompidou Center, and this is important for all project leaders, and this provides solutions to the partners, cultural partners. The question of demand is really important. Um, partners, cultural life partners, there are many of them. Um, there are international ones. There's no limit to the number of partners that there can be. In And the role is to define objectives. We do uh, definition studies in order to implement program, programs, mobilize funds, and produce artistic and cultural projects because there are two two components there are the there's infrastructure uh, and then cultural infrastructure and then there are cultural events and here i would say that cultural uh, engineering is less important here because the production of cultural events is more in in the genes of cultural teams so that's something you can sell when you've got a skill you can you can sell it but there's not a very uh, original aspect that cultural engineering can bring so what we need to underline here is that fundamentally things have changed a lot over 40 years or over 35 years the term was created in uh, 1986, it's 35 years later now, a generation has moved on. I, I sold my agency to one of my employers who has now just sold it again to new owners. So we're now at the third generation of the ABCD um, agency. I think that what's interesting in of cultural engineering for museums is 
external help to help museums and elected officials to help the development and also the development of resources but this can be something this can add add, add compli complications which we'll talk about later thank you very much for this brief explanation um i'm very uh, sorry i didn't introduce claude mollard you have it written down in front of you i hope claude mollard is an expert in cultural engineering and he's currently a special advisor to the president to the president of the arab world institute um, i suppose that this presentation is going to require some precisions from the economists that you are you are the founder jean hervé lorenzi a uh, member of the cercle des economistes think tank and president of the association for the rencontre économique in aix-en-provence you are at this same time the chair of the of demographic transitions and economic transitions of the risk foundation as well as the editorial director of the risk uh, journal and you also work on development under France Museums. I will hand over to you now, Jean-Hervé Lorenzo, for the time that you've uh, agreed to give us. Thank you very much for being with us. I'll just add two things. I'm an old friend, uh, and I'm an, I have admired Claude Muller since the 1980s. Uh, our careers have been very similar, actually, because I was in the Ministry of Industry, and uh, one of my jobs was to work with the uh, Ministry of Culture at that point, which had some interesting tensions, but it was great fun, and um, uh, was, there was a kind of vision, exceptional vision of the world after uh, 1981, but actually we discovered that things didn't change so so much but then thanks to Hervé Barbaret I joined a new world which was not mine the the world of culture I'm not a Philistine but I'm not really in your world and I really uh, observe it with much admiration and I say that I've still got a few years to 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 understand what's what's said uh, in this world um, Claude talked about the world of cultural engineering, and he talked about this definition. He is the author of this term, so it's a very good definition. If one of us enters the Académie Française, I suggest that we um, use very precisely uh, these terms that Claude um, mentioned. I suppose that you have you're expecting from an from a mature and older economist who's prudent and with has some experience i suggest I imagine you're expecting a answer a simple answer to a question is the crisis uh, that we're living in is it favorable to cultural engineering or not is it going to help us or not i I'm using the term us because I'm taking ownership of this definition of Claude Muller. Are we going to be um, carried by events or not? And I need to say that I am both uncertain, uh, perplexed and a little worried from the outside of the cultural world. And with a lot of humility, I want to give some advice uh, on the ways in which I think the defenders of cultural engineering should um, do this because France needs a push forward in a very simple way what we understood between 1980 and 1986 I've got about the same career as, as Claude in in 1986 my services weren't required anymore but i did something excellent actually which was which was to move into a to the area of architecture so i feel that between 1980 and 1986 in terms of my memories of what 
impacted that period was the increase of budget for the cultural ministry of culture this energy that you claude and jack long gave to this sector and then perhaps even more fundamentally this idea that culture and cultural engineering are areas where where france shines and helps it where france can find its identity and its talent that it's not always easy for other sectors of activity and one question that we are were perhaps asking in 1981 was whether culture would be a key aspect of of dynamizing uh, french culture this is not a political question this is just about this period and the talent of the men and women uh, at that time and i think this question is even more important now is we are in a period now that we sometimes define perhaps not wrongly as a declassification of france in both economic social and political terms this is a very difficult times and i think that our cultural foundation our cultural ad adventure heritage um, are excellent ways to rediscover uh, uh, an ability to bounce back um, in, in terms of coming out of the crisis i am less optimistic than the french ministry uh, of finance but but uh, everyone has their own role as uh, juliette asked me to speak as an economist i'm I'm, uh, I thought I wasn't very competent, but I thought I'd have a look at the figures in order to to see what was going on. And I was really surprised by a whole series of aspects which should help us to think about the way in which we can um, ha behave politically and economically in the coming months. The first aspect was that we should be aware of what culture represents in France, the number of people that are working in it. That's 700,000 people working in this sector. We know this, but what surprised me more, and I discovered this in a, in a study, is that you could see that four-fifths of cultural products defined as being more than 50% percent um paid for beyond their cost they they are they are marketed so that means that only a fifth of cultural products in 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 the, in the sense of uh, were actually non-marketed goods so that was something that really surprised me um because in the morning I used to work in Bercy at the Ministry of Finance on the budget and I used to explain that we had to be really very serious that we had to take care of this money and then in the evening like Claude said I used to think about how we could spend the money and there was an aspect a perspective which was very focused on the budget very focused on public policy and public policy in the sense that we we mean eco economic as economists and these are questions um that in involve changes to society and which uh, cost money as claude talked about earlier that it would come together in in a world and we need to have this in mind for what's coming next we are in a world that is a commercial world the second aspect that you know very well but it was a surprise for me is that this sector has been very affected by the by the crisis of course you know very well the U european union has seen this uh, activity drop uh, by 30 percent across across the union this is really a very difficult period and this has been very supported by the public authorities actually not so much as that 11 billion um, 
I found that the description in my in my in my study was was difficult, but it represents that the amount represents about the same as the this transport sector, which is not negligible. We put eleven billion into this sector, and this enables the sector to continue to live and function. But when I regarded the recovery plan, because we're not just going to talk about the past, we're also going to think about the future because cinemas are opening, uh, theatres are opening, all of this is going to open up again. We can see that in the recovery plan, it's not amazing. And if we believe that culture is playing a major role in the redynamization and the way that we're going to relaunch uh, the the country we realize that what's what's been set aside in culture which is two billion um I, I, you might say that's in, enough but actually I, I really don't think it's it's enough and since there's going to be a second recovery plan and there's been a false debate between the communists uh, as people are saying, was the was the first plan not good enough? All the usual things that economists love doing together. Um, of course, there's going to be a second recovery plan. There will be the candidate, the current president, in October or November. I can't give you the precise date. It might be the 20th or 21st November. He's going to announce something. It won't be called the second recovery plan, but it will be the second record recovery plan. And it's there that's going to be a battle because this recovery plan needs and and that's what i'm really want to militate for this recovery plan needs to focus on technology on training and it needs to also focus on culture and if this recovery plan if it won't be called the recovery plan but that's what it will be in in reality and maybe there'll be 30 or 40 billion in that recovery plan and we need at least seven or eight if you have less than that, Juliette, you should just forget your activities and head off to the com country and and rest, um, because this is a real challenge of what about around what's going to happen, and we have to fight here. Again, another surprise for me was that I, I thought that a president that was really very attentive to history and to heritage and everything that we consider as a foundation for French society, I thought there would be a bit more. But uh, but we're going to have to um, have to have 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 a have a, have a, 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 a way of reaching out as as I do for my events in in Provence. And I have more partners this year than I had uh, last year, but even in 2019. This means that everything is possible if we um, we put energy into our communication. So my first recommendation would be to use would be to say ten, two billion is not enough. We need seven or eight more, and. Uh, this should feed into the nature of the type of projects. And dear Claude, who who is no longer in the Ministry of the Budget, but knows everything about it, all the the strings, and knows how all the projects work and how to get them involved. But we need our friends from the Ministry of the Budget, and we need to find the the items here. And and I'm coming to my my fourth point, my fourth surprise, cultural engineering that Claude defined, and I looked very seriously at what had been written. I, I really prepared this point very well. We have to say that it is f absolutely fundamental that it's known through the Abu Dhabi Louvre, the other 20 companies are not so well know, known, and so we have to do publicity. To do the, these 20 companies, there might be 30, 40, or 50 of them. They need, they need to be better known, and they need to work off this simple idea that we are a fundamentally commercial world, a world that is about the production of public goods like water, electricity, objects. 
um, of things that w we can imagine and it needs to be developed. We are the sector which is the most important to develop in the years to come because I need to sh share some slight pessimism about the way the situation in which we are is, is developing in the in the quarter that's coming because um, there needs to be a, a big increase in activity. Yeah, I think that if Hervé, who I am very glad to be part of two groups with him, the the, the group of bald people and also his association, maybe all of you who have an extraordinary image, this is this is the way the time we need where we need to explain why this culture has uh, this sector has three important advantages we're going to be uh, developing very quickly everywhere in the world we also have a competitive advantage um, because uh, yeah, against all other uh, countries and the third thing is that this is something an op a point of optimism for the development of French culture. I take part in three or four meetings on the economic situation every week. If there's a if there's a minister or someone from the from the from the public ministries, they can they they say that everything's going to bounce back. We've never seen activity like this. This is what the politicians say, which is all about lifting our our, our, our morale. But we have we are. I'm a bit skeptical because COVID has brought one good thing. It's helped us to see that not everything is perfect in the country and that there are weak areas that have grown over the last decades that we have to work on. So I would really argue for hard work, lobbying, communication, uh, lobbying is not the right word really, um, but, but I'm just trying to help you understand what I mean. We need to communicate um, in using these words, these wonderful words of cultural engineering, the, the, the word engineering gives us this idea that we have to use all the techniques and everything um, that we that we want that we need all the scientific and technical resources um, and the, perhaps the culture is the remaining area where French people believe they have a still have a, a role to play and if we could act on that I think that would be brilliant. So, are, is the situation uh, favorable to us? I I don't know, because Juliette was kind enough to say that I have uh, um, I've written a book. I can't avoid uh, giving you the, the title and, and encouraging you to go to a pharmacy and to buy it, because it's brilliant for uh, people with insomnia. It's called The Great Disruption. Um, it's not a bad book, and it describes what's going to happen. And and I haven't been too wrong over the last 30 years, uh, which is perhaps a mark of experience. Uh, I'm not very talented. M more talented people than I. Um, can can speak better on these things, but I want to suggest that the following things are going to happen. Um, COVID is going to accelerate a movement which was written in our history, in our economic history. And when I talk about our economic history, I'm talking about the economic history of the world, which was already um, marked at a global level linked to a number of phenomena. Uh, three of them are very clear. And then the COVID came and accelerated the mechanics of this, but hasn't fundamentally changed them. First of all, there is uh, technology, which we talk all about all day long, um, um, ha has grown very exceptionally, but what economists 
um, I'll talk about is productivity gains, which is what helps us to grow and see growth. At the time that technology grows, grain the gain, the productivity gains, are all around the world over the last seven or eight years. And so what we're talking about, potential growth is not amazing because these productivity gains are not rising. We're going to have a 2021 year um, that, but, but we're, this, these things are generally on a downward trend. The second thing is that we are in a an aging world. It was very kind that of Juliet to say that I I, I work in what what I'm wanting to say is that the average age of society is rising, which doesn't mean that the population is increasing. Um, we know we're going to hit to nine or ten billion uh, by 2050, but the growing uh, the, the 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 growth linked to longevity and the the way well, these phenomena phenomena of longevity are meaning that uh, that demographic growth is uh, even all around the world dropping so just to bring us to one last subject which is the uh, social imbalance in which we uh, are living everyone's using these terms inequality everyone's saying that the world we have built everywhere on all the continents is a very uh, full of inequality and this will not survive forever we've got to find solutions which is going to be possible because i think the 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 what we're hearing from biden and and from others is that there is an an ideological disruption which is really unimaginable we need to get behind this the idea of increasing corporate uh, taxes um, to reduce inequalities this is in a total disruption and this is what we need to get involved in and support and i think we're going to have a recovery that's going to be fairly strong the presidential election in about 10 months and this is going to uh, lead the authorities to boost activity. So I have no fear that this activity is going to be pretty strong in the year to come. I'm not going to go into questions of debt and all that because um, that would take me just too much time. But what I want to say is that we're going to encounter more difficult issues than what we've uh, experienced over a, a year where things really need to get going in France, in Germany. So, and this is where we really have to fight in order to um, get more public funds. I gave my figures earlier, which is not not just a, a little thing. This is a system which gives us a, a year of respite. My conviction is that just as in 83, uh, Claude, as you as you remember in our youth, in 83, the governments, whether they were of the right or the left, they were all doing the same thing. They all uh, now they're all saying that we have to be more serious. That's that's the word that politicians use a lot. But you're going to see that things are going to be become more complicated. And since this is battles at an international level between the the um, Europe, the USA, and China, all of this is going to create tension. So I'm not convinced that we're going to have a, a, a disruption as if there had been a, a trend, a, a straight line going going up. But this, this 
curve has been interrupted by a crisis, but actually it's just going to restart and it will never and it will never, never stop again. No, that's not going to work. The world economy has never worked that way. We're going to go from surprise to surprise. And fundamentally, I think that 2023, 2025 are, are not going to be very easy, really, because I think at that point, we're going to come back to what what was used to construct the recovery of 2020 2021 i won't reveal all of the exceptional aspects that are in this book which is being sold for 18 euros but if you buy 10 the 11th is free so you can see um you can really enjoy that I just wanted to say one final thing on this really interesting topic. I am really ready to participate in this. In the coming years, we need to manage to explain how the French economy, the French society, our social, political and economic structure is primarily funded, founded on our ability to show the world that we are taking back control enthusiastically of cultural sectors. You know this list of, of various disciplines and fields. This is the only way, and I am saying this quite firmly because I really do believe this profoundly. One of the only ways that we have to re-establish this desire to live and to produce that we've lost somehow in our country, this is the only way to do that. So this is um, uh, so the old school speaking here, but uh, I hope that I've been able to convince you of what I believe. Thank you very much, Juliette. I know I spoke for a long time. I will be watching the rest of this at a later date because the rest of the debate is, is very necessary. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to watch that live now, but I will be catching up later. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you very much, Jean Hervé. I know that you are very uh, rushed right now. If there are any questions in the chat, then I will send them to you. This is not an old school presentation. This is a very optimistic presentation. And it's giving us the opportunity to, to seize these opportunities coming. I think that we are all working in museums. The vast majority of the people in the room today, in any case, are convinced that culture is at the heart of reconstruction. But we do not necessarily know exactly how to grasp this question and take hold of it. You've given us a few ideas we need to invest resources and i think that this deliberate strategy is something that we are not necessarily lacking but perhaps we are too disheartened to to be so um, offensive in our in our attack in our um in our approach i would just like to say one thing we have a lot of debates on the 24th of September for our General Assembly. One of the questions that we're going to ask, and perhaps I will re-invite Jean Hervé at that point, to ask what cultural policy museums need. And this is the idea behind all of this. We believe that we are the ones that need to say what we need we need to tell our politicians it's not that we know better than the politicians it's just that things have changed an awful lot and despite that we've taken a lot of different measures we've changed so much during the the pandemic we have a little organization with elena vassal 
So initially, Claude um, was meant to speak a little bit longer. Perhaps we could continue with this economic section before handing back to Claude. And then we will have Antonio Rodriguez. So what do you think, Claude? Yes, I can finish my, my, my speech. Would you like to do that now? Yes, let's do that now. So, Claude, back over to you. And then, of course, you will be able to speak again during the debate. Yes, to come back over to what uh, Jean-Hervé Lorenzi was saying, what we have often said, uh, Jack Long and myself, and in, what Emmanuel Macron, President of France, have said, is that Roosevelt, in the twen crisis of 29 and throughout the 30s, helped Americans through large public works to fight unemployment and social misery. But he also financed artists' workshops, theatres, orchestras. And that is how the American school post-war had its age of splendor of, of contemporary American art. And this is through the intervention of public authorities, this state budget. We have a vision of the Americans in which we think that um, the market rules all, but the democratic rule through this, um, this process meant that culture had its heyday. And that's what Biden is doing. He's preparing a cultural recovery program in the US. When we see the difficulties that we have here in France, the French president has announced that he will be allocating 30 million euros to artists. We say, great, 30 million euros is what I had in equivalent terms in 1980 to 1986, so over a five-year period. This is an excellent opportunity, 30 million euros in just one year, but no cent has been spent over the past year. People do not know there's, there's a lack of cultural engineering in the sphere of the state here. Apparently, perhaps I'm mistaken, but that's what I've identified. We're not able to find a solution to get this trickling down to the artists. And I think that Jean-Hervé Lorenzi is completely right. We need to really focus in on this. Behind this, there's motivation, there's invention, openness to young people and young artists. This is about teaching in schools. What we did in 2000 with Pascal Long, 2000, 2001, 2002, we had 40,000 school classes having special artistic classes. This can be done. We know how to do it, but we have to want to do it. I'd like to come back now to another aspect. Let's talk about the future. The past is great. We need to remember what's happened. The future of cultural engineering and for museums, museums' role within that. It's interesting to observe that museums, which previously were an object of cultural engineering, helping museums to, con to design projects, building a museum, but museums have now become a subject in this, a stakeholder. They've become an active player. We've changed things round. This means that in, in, in terms of, of the depths of cultural engineering, we've, we've tried to introduce trade uh, within museums, objectify artworks, transform cultural centers into supermarkets selling artworks from museums etc and that's obviously false that's not what people have done but museums have now become an active stakeholder if i take the arab world a very concrete example here we've made the most of the crisis here in order to make progress The, the, this is a museum, but it's also a little bit like the Centre Pompidou, a little bit smaller. It's an auditorium, it's a library, etc. There's exhibitions, a museum, and many other things. So they made the most of this period where there was no longer this pressure from 
public, from the general public or from organizing exhibitions to think about our role and organization in this new context of the cultural economy and the mission of a multidimensional institution like the IMA. And we concluded that we needed to create a platform which we called IMAGO. IMAGO because this is more than just IMA. It's part of IMA, but it may become a subsidiary of IMA. It transcends the services of IMA. This is a horizontal platform around three different strategies. The first area is cultural engineering, which is what we're talking about today. As a cultural engineering practitioner, I started working with IMA to develop projects like I had in 2015, a cultural audit of Tunisia on the basis of various opportunities that I had, so it, that it became then one of the institution's activities. So the first area of strategic area is, um, is cultural engineering, focusing in on, on projects that um, aren't necessarily just focusing in on the Arab world as well. The second is about professional or vocational training. We have a school at IMA, which is quite consistent with our purpose. There's an Arab language school at IMA, which is very important, and students enroll in that every single year. Students, um, or perhaps even older um, students in continuing education. And this is a little bit like the professional school at the Centre Pomp Pompidou, and we're currently building and um, redesigning a room here. This is was called the Salle d'Actualité, the news room, and it's going to become a training room in the morning and then a room to present donations in the afternoon to showcase Claude Lemont's um, donation, who has um, gifted us with 1,600 works of art from the Arab world. And this is the largest museum of Arab art and culture in the Western world. The next strategic area is developing traveling exhibitions. During the COVID crisis, this is one of the happy coincidences. It meant that the Orient Express exhibition was able to be exported to Singapore. And we've been able to create an IMA museum in Singapore with Jean Nouvelle's support in that and we've been working on that sometimes an exhibition can generate other activities and we're working in a social economic and cultural development process here that will contribute second in a secondary way but still in an important way to developing income own streams of income so we've applied all of this to ourselves working in a single direction with the um, Museum of Exhibitions. Nathalie Bondil has been working with us for the past month, who used to work in Montreal with the, in the Fine Arts Museum. She will be promoting the IMA Museum on an international scale. I'm telling you all of this because this platform is just getting started. We were able to do this because of the COVID crisis. And this will help us to generate our own income in the future. This is already happening, but it's also allowing us to modify our way of working within IMA. The platform has meant that all of the services that I've talk, talked about, the, the, the building, every three weeks or so, we have a steering committee meeting in order to bring the platform forward. So this creates internal governance which is very cross-cutting, cross-disciplinary. It's very new. 
it's breaking down barriers. People are talking to one another around a single common project. And it's putting our practices into practice. It's creating an HR development process as well across different services and departments within IMA by introducing the possibility for all IMA employees to work with management on a project, a cultural engineering project or a traveling exhibition project or a training project. This gives all employees the opportunity to work on external projects outside of their usual jobs. This is a way of, of self-training in a certain, to a certain extent. And we can also work with um, public construction or public works companies looking to build a museum, for instance. And the employees of museums are going to be confronted with what the museum construction market needs. This is a means of training our staff. It requires modifications, consultations, and we're at the heart of all of that at the moment. But it's extremely positive because it's a way of reconceiving and changing our way of viewing um, management. So for Santra Pompidou, I do regret the Cross the cross disciplinary aspect, which was meant to be provided by housing all of these aspects within a single building, but that's not always the case. And we need to invent something here in order to re establish this cross disciplinary working. We know that art and culture necessarily need to be cross cutting and cross disciplinary disciplines. Any artistic discipline that does not communicate with the others is going to fade away and die away. What I found was that cultural engineering internally within this um, museum inspired by Pompidou, I, I did the IMA program in 81 and I just finished construction of the, the Centre, Centre Pompidou. So I um, took the Centre Pompidou and I condensed that um, calling this the, the Arab Institute and this system worked quite well and it was um, developing at the time. Like all institutions, there's a birth, there's a life and then there's a death. So we need to find a way of regenerating IMA. So this IMAGO platform, which um, one day may become um, more widespread. So IMAGO is a way of flourishing, of being creative, of opening up to the world. And it's very interesting. That's everything that I have to say. I will talk in the debate later on. I do agree with Jean-Hervé Lorenzi on the importance in the two coming years to accelerate cultural policy. I can see this through decentralization. And I'm very connected to that. IMA itself has created a, a local regional uh, IMA in Tourcoing, where we work with cities. So the city of Montpellier, for instance, we have projects with them. We have partnerships with large cities like Argenteuil, Saint-Denis, with 300,000 residents each time, inhabitants. So through these projects and these partnerships, we are confronted with another world. So in Saint-Denis, for instance, in the suburbs of Saint-Denis, which was the center of the French Catholic Church in the 11th century with, um, with the Saint-Denis Basilisk. And it's a, a candidate and applicant at the moment for the European Capital of Culture, we're working together to define a concept for the city of Saint-Denis and surrounding municipalities can hold and carry these values of urban mixity as, as a new centrality that, that, that could be 
a means of supporting it in its application to be European capital of culture. So IMA has a role to play in that. It, the culture of the Arab world, which is present in France, in over 7 million of our uh, inhabitants in France that are of direct or indirect North African heritage. So cultural, urban, scientific mixity, that is France, the richness of integration. And this started with Sefian. Um, the, and, and this, the, the people, the, 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 the coming of peoples into Europe has always been from east to west. And that's where Chauvet and others and other cultural institutions, our first cultural institutions were born, but that's perhaps another topic. Thank you very much, Claude. We're going to continue our debate now. Time is going too fast. And we're now going to hand over to Hervé Barbaret. You were director of um, of France Museums of the Louvre, and since September 2019, you are Managing Director of the France Museums Agency. Juliette mentioned in her introduction this turning point with the opening of the Louvre in Abu Dhabi and the creation of the France Museums Agency. And I would like you perhaps shortly, to give us some of the objectives before creation of this agency and tell us how this model is original and what model you're using and how it's an echo chamber of French expertise, which we have been talking about since the start of this evening. Thank you very much, Hélène. Yes, this is a essential question. And what's really interesting this evening is to see to what extent, um, un unlike uh, the, the title of Jean Hervé's book, there isn't a great disruption because this institution of cultural in engineering of, of like France Museum is a, was a prefiguration in everything that Claude has said. There was a favorable environment and the uh, the Abu Dhabi Louvre um, program, which France Museums has made possible, um, there's nothing actually that's new under the sun. Um, perhaps there are just uh, three points which I'd really like to focus in on, because the crucial moment of the Abu Dhabi project, which has led to the creation of France Museum. That's what I'm going to focus on first of all, and then, uh, and then second on France Museum itself. Um, uh, we're looking at the key question together is, does the museum intelligence have a, have a price? Without um, going into the conclusion that I'd like to arrive to is, in what we've heard from Jean-Marie Lorenzi, if there are 7 billion that are going to be uh, directed uh, to um, culture in November, we need to be convinced that museums have a price and at least some of this money needs to be used to pay the price. So first of all, let's talk about the Louvre in Abu Dhabi and cultural engineering in France. The um, Louvre in Abu Dhabi is really a, a unique setting. It's a place that's fairly counterintuitive, an Arabic place, but we are asking the, pardon, the French authorities were asked to help the Abu Dhabi authorities to create a universal museum. We've been working on universal museums for two centuries. The reality is that comes out of the humanist um, museums. Um, actually, that's got nothing to do really with uh, a, a universal museum in 2021. But this is a concept that needs to be radically renovated. So when we talk about in the, it's the intelligence of museums have a, a price, um, we've had to do extensive work to reimagine what a universal museum could be like in the 21st century. And in particular, 
in this part of the world. Naturally, I'm not going to go into develop this point, but it's clear that this reflection led major national museums to review uh, their collections which present this universality and universality of of um, 1773 when the Louvre was created this universal universality is create is now carried by this Pompidou Center by the Mos Orsay Museum by many other institutions so we're wanting to see museums come back together we need to see museums come together in order to have uh, work together to, to design uh, projects and to serve works in a totally new way. This is a point that that shows that the the Louvre and Abu Dhabi plan uh, came from a, in a similar point uh, of bringing together museums around a common project. So since museums had to come together, of course, the, the solution which seemed logical was to say, we need to have a common structure, a structure that brings together museums. And this structure will be the place where we are going to concentrate the, the brains, the, the thinking um, of these teams. But uh, the, our, our teams are, are, are not those who come up with the projects, but our role is to coordinate and to drive them forward. So cultural engineering required for the Abu Dhabi Louvre project, a structure dedicated specifically that brings together national museums. So it's a subsidiary of museums of, pri of private, it's a private structure called France Museums, which has a vocation to to lead the Abu Dhabi Louvre project, but museums all also wanted it to bring expertise more broad, more broadly um, with uh, France Museum, which has been developed, which is designed to provide French museums expertise since 2010. So we have to be very clear that there was really an extraordinary ambition around this of project of the Abu Dhabi Louvre, which also has a slightly more negative side, which is the fact that it needs to be protection. There's been a, a, a reflex is that cultural objects or products are not commercial. So we needed to have a a, a, an avant-garde structure which helped museums to protect themselves um, in, in, able to, in order to put in place a dedicated structure. But very quickly, this debate um, came to an end because uh, this project really showed how well it had been put together. The project in Abu Dhabi, there was a discussion and debate around the price but uh, this quickly was resolved because the intelligence that was provided by these museums was was really very extraordinary and needed to be promoted. So the Abu Dhabi um, Louvre is a universal project, really an extraordinary project and initial concept, both in its implementation, its architecture. It's one of the greatest um, masterpieces of Jean Nouvel. It's a really brilliant composition with a um, acquisition policy that made it possible for the collection to grow quickly, but also with loans of works, which enables museums to, to be among the big museums from the very beginning. Um, so French museums from 2017, when it opened, um, this museum was uh, among uh, was a big player. So this is my first point: was just to focus in on the Abu Dhabi Louvre, just to show that, in compared with the favorable environment that had been created, this exceptional um, project of Abu Dhabi justified 
cultural engineering taking a new dimension and lead to the creation of France museums, which comes from the national museums to serve cultural engineering in Abu Dhabi and other projects as well. So now um, let's go on to a second point and talk about France museums, because it's true that the Louvre in Abu Dhabi justifies the creation of this. But beyond that, why do we need a structure? Why do we need cultural engineering? Because this has already been seen, but it's clear that a museum does not need a support. It's just a building, you put works in it and that's it. Actually, no, what I want to say in my second point is that most people here working in museums, so I don't really need to convince them, but the truth is that a museum is a complex, very complex system. A museum is not just a building with works in it. A museum is something that needs to tell a story, which is carried by collections. Um, there's also the, con the concept to imagine there's a, this revival of universalism. I mean, all museums need to tell a story based on collections, but all museums also need to ensure that they have an audience and they need to think about their relationships with the audiences. Who is it that we want to bring into our museum? And then there's also the question of cultural mediation. This is a very complex issue today because it, it, it invites us to develop technological systems which are sometimes very complex but they're also they're also simple sim systems publications etc so beyond just the message and the collections there's the question of audiences and then this the program and the audience are welcomed in a building so it leads us into architecture uh, scenography and then health and safety issues and then the fourth a fourth aspect is a business model that needs to be developed so all of this produces a complex system museums are very complicated and i'll just add something to what claude Mollard said earlier um, museums are not just building um, works in a building with an audience and this was uh, claude showed this with the example of the Pompidou Centre, Center. there's also the connection of audiences with creation and this in the broadest sense of a, a museum it goes it goes beyond just demonstrating works um, I don't want to become nostalgic but it's really clear to be aware that a museum can't just be produced out of nothing with, with a click of the fingers it requires a lot of expertise it requires mobilizing lots of skills and that's why um, supporting uh, those who commission works for museums is really fundamental and there are many um, failures in the world of museums we've often had a public or private um, entity that's decided to do museum that's going to be a really chic thing i'm going to go and see an architect and then the whole methodology and the whole concepts uh, aspect of concept gets put, put aside and we end up at museums that are architecturally interesting with collections that are less interesting so these museographical failures are often uh, to do with a, a, a poor design poor programming or no programming so i won't mention these failures there are there are a lot of them abroad but also in france but I really would like to insist fundamentally on this fact that cultural engineering in the museum world is really based on this fundamental principle that is a complex system in the same way that you're not going to produce a nuclear power station with a click of the fingers. Um, this, you're not going to produce a, wi a wind farm with a click of the fingers. Um, it's a museum is equally complex and it requires support and that is what France Museum is there to do. The third concluding point um, which is really key is to do with whether museums have a price. We, we are in complex 
uh, economic situations because the impact of museum is, has how they have certain externalities yes there's an economic and tourist impact but there's also the in impact of infrastructure for cultural social and edu educational reasons which connects into economic methods linked into public public goods so the idea of having a commercial approach uh, when we're in a public sphere is something that's really quite complicated nevertheless any museum like any cultural uh, cultural good has a price the question is who who pays that price and so the question is who is paying that price so here again we need to think about the economic mixes and um, there are contributors who pay there might be sponsorship or patronage there's also um, the, the concession the, um, the concessionaries within museums but as we everything we talk about in the museum world yes the the intelligence of museums the know-how of museums has a price and this is what's always been the case the question is who pays that price um, those who are in charge of setting up museums need to have very clear ideas in order to clarify this specific point and once again france museum is there to think through this kind of question and this brings us back to um jean -Ave lorenzo who said just a, a few moments ago that in the development of france museum he is the the president of the board because uh, that part, sorry there is a a, a a board because and he is competent because he is an economist and economics economics is really important um and to have his perspective yes it's a bit uh, off the wall sometimes but it's really very precious to us it's um museums need to be supported by a whole number of experts um curators um technical support but it's also uh, people who are a bit more distant from the day-to-day -day activity like jean jean hervé lorenzi um, who bring an external perspective and it's really very clear that the know-how of museums yes it it does have a price thank you very much hervé i'm going to pass uh, straight on to agnes Asal. Um, because I think there's a lot of similarity between uh, what you're saying and your projects. I'll just remind you that Agnes was the um, w was at this, the Pompidou Centre, and she worked together on the own resources of the institution. And she'll talk un undoubtedly about like that because uh, Pompidou Centre talks about these these Pompidou centers that are away from, that are, are offset from the central uh, Pompidou center, which has developed this idea of developing their own resources. But she is currently responsible for the international and cultural uh, program in the ministry. And you are also senior official for equality, diversity, and the prevention of discrimination. And Agnes, I'd really like you to talk again about this aspect of expertise, which Ervi was talking about at the end of his his session. And perhaps you could present this expertise within the ministry, which is perhaps not very well known. Thank you very much, Hélène. Thank you, Juliette. Uh, we're moving into a new era. As Claude Moller said, the Ministry of, the C of Culture in France has taken a lot of time, and I do regret this, to take hold of the real need for a strategy to value 
cultural expertise internationally. There have been excellent examples of this, public, of public institutions that have equipped themselves and taken on the tools that they need to sell, and I'm not scared of that word, to sell their know-how and skills and experience overseas. We've talked about the Pompidou Centre and the experiments that are going on, this provisional and um, traveling Pompidou Centres and many others, there's the Musée Picasso, the Musée d'Orsay, and many others. And there's this excellent example that Hervé has talk, talked about with the um, Louvre in Abu Dhabi. But all of these experiences, even if they have made the way for the, the valuation of cultural expertise, the Ministry of Culture until now, until two years ago, has been looking at these experiments without necessarily playing an imminent role. Um, this is my opinion, and I'm not the only person to think this. The Ministry of Culture needs to have a leading role in the design valuation and support of exporting our expertise overseas. This is why a little over two years ago, at the end of 2018, the French Ministry of Culture at the time proposed a, a strategy which successive ministries have now continued under the current leadership to propose the creation of a structure within the central administration, this mission under the cultural ministry with the cabinet and ministers, all of the central administration ministries, networks, DRAC, regional competency boards, etc., in order to organize, coordinate, and ensure the consistency of expertise promotion activities. This can be museums, but it's much broader than that. Our ambition is to be able to promote and export our know how not just in terms of heritage, which is the most well known, there's already very successful experiences of export and promotion here. But what we would like to do is for cinema, audiovisual, video games, music, architecture, and, and, and law and all of the legal field that we've been able to develop in France. We have skills and competencies that we can make available to our overseas colleagues. It's the same for governance as well. The scope is very broad for cultural engineering. We have the skills needed where we are today to promote these. We want to promote skills from within the state services in the broadest sense of the term, but also locally where we have remarkable skills. The other museums in France or cultural services within municipalities as well. There are associations and nonprofits that work in this field as well. We also have the capacity to mobilize private sector experience and expertise. This is a baseline, a vital baseline in the public sector. But sometimes we need to supplement this and enrich this expertise and experience through skills and competencies that we primarily find in the private sector as they're more specific. So this international cultural expertise mission aims to prospect international markets to see what could need French expertise. Could be the desire to develop cultural projects. Perhaps a country wants to develop a museum, the equivalent of a, a concert hall or a training course. 
in most cultural expertise uh, projects, we have a lot of training and we need to be uh, much more aggressive in our approach um, than we have been until, until now. If I think of the UK or Germany or Italy or China and other international partners that have had a much more offensive strategy in this. And um, they are able to place and position their competencies. And we are now looking to open our mouth to say France is competent in these fields too. We need to detect needs and present our skills. The cultural expertise mission is also there as a point of entry. International partners are not going to be able to go around five, six or seven French institutions before finding the right partner that may be able to meet their needs, have the time and the capacity to meet all of their needs. The cultural expertise mission is an easy point of entry, and I'm hoping that it's becoming better known now. So French by um, foreign governments, sorry, by foreign investment institutions as well. We're working every day with the French agencies for development, Expertise France, Business France. And we are now regularly responding to European calls for tender and call for projects for cultural activities. And we are applying more and more for these programs. We are the place that is easiest to access and needs are now going and the demand is going to be concentrated within our organization. We're able to refine our knowledge of the needs. So people saying that they want to create a museum, where, how, with which collections, what's your target audience? What staff are you going to be working with? Everything that Jean Hervé was talking about earlier, we ask those questions from the from the start and enter into dialogue with the person opposite in order to position ourselves. And the third role of the International Cultural Expertise Mission, which is our longest term mission in in a sense, is to play a role of assembling, bringing everything together. We're generalists in French culture. We are able to find the best experts wherever they are in our services, in our public institutions, in local municipalities or in the private sector, as I said earlier. And this allows us to compose a dedicated project team for the order that has been placed with us. We're able to secure funding for the project. We're working on the basis of remunerated projects and some colleagues in the ministry are working with cultural cooperation, which needs to continue. We're not replacing that we're creating a new mode of intervention which is based on remuneration for a service provided so we compose a team of experts in project functioning from multiple different institutions so that we're not tempted to reproduce a french or national model onto an international reality, which by definition is different through its political, geographical, cultural, economic situation. So we take experts from different institutions in order to make us more adaptable and flexible. And then we enter into the really exciting phase of project construction and I would even call this co-construction. We're not coming along with a catalogue of, of products. We know how to make a museum. This is what you need to do. Here's the recipe. No, we have a team in order to assess in detail the, the nature of the local need and to work together with the partner to, to co-build or co-construct 
with our skills, the, the, the structure or institution, it could be a museum, it could be a concert hall, it could be a filming studio, for instance, we adapt and ourselves and target the context in order to provide a service that best meets the needs whilst remaining uh, aware of our long-term desire to work alongside our partners throughout the project and until it's completed, so until opening to the public of the cultural venue that we've created. What's important for us is that from upstream, as soon as there's the initial idea of the project, we're using our know-how and skills and competencies alongside the people who are going to be managing the new cultural centre. We work a lot with the French National Heritage Institute and at the Ministry of Culture, our desire is to structure training programmes so that our contacts from the host country can take ownership almost of the of the project so that they can keep it going after after we finished our work debates around cultural engineering have 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 the key issue here that we need to to have remuneration of course there's no reason for, for for cultural services not to be remunerated but we're going one step further we're giving our partners more with this dimension here that's creating democratic cultural and social balance in the countries where we're working i believe that it is legitimate to develop this further. I will perhaps talk about this later on, but we've been working on around 10 international projects over the past two years, always in partnership with um, Agence Française du Développement, INP, we've been working in Tunisia, in Benin, Ethiopia, Cameroon, and we're working in um, Mali, Chad, Senegal, and many other projects that are going to be coming in. And I think the Ministry of Culture has this capacity to take hold of the issue of cultural engineering and to get the tools that we need in order to meet needs. I really do think that we have moved up a, a stage in line with this previously utopic uh, idea that Claude was talking about and we're now in the reality of putting that into practice today. Thank you very much. We thank you, Agnès, for what you have said. This really does give us the desire to listen to you, to go further with you. Thank you for the experience um, of cultural engineering in, in Mali, Benin, Senegal, Chad, it's really exciting to hear about that. We are now in our meeting going to move on to the next phase. I'm going to continue with our speakers before we move on to a debate section. I, I don't know if you're reading the chat. There's a lot going on. We will be look about that. Anais, would you like to speak now or are we going to keep the same order? I know that you have a personal um, obligation. Um, I, think, I think I've managed to... Uh, to, to free myself up for later on. So we can move on to Antonio before before you. Okay, Antonio Rodriguez. I hope that I'm not mistaken in the order that we had originally planned. Uh, 
Elena, please do correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Antonio Rodriguez, I'm speaking to you in French and you are going to be speaking in English. Thank you very much for accepting being with us today, listening to us. It, so important for us to have representatives of ICOM internationally. You are chairman of the ICOM International Committee for Exhibition Exchange. You're speaking to us from the United States. Thank you very much for taking your time here. What's really interesting in this stage of the discussion, you've heard a lot from our colleagues sharing their experience the experiences that they have had. We've got a bit of um, of hindsight as well uh, around the mindset in France about cultural engineering. We were talking about that earlier and um, Jean-Hervé Lorenzi encouraged us to, to take a position with regard to that. It would be really interesting, Antonio, if you could tell us your point of view, what's happening in other countries as chairman of the International Committee for Exhibition Exchange. Some of your members are from all of the ICOM countries. There's 134 member countries of ICOM, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm sure that so they don't all necessarily work with cultural engineering, but I'm sure that these have fed into, these different countries have fed into this, this issue, what's being said. And do you think that it's an, an important forum, ICOM as well? Over to you, Antonio, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia. I really appreciate the opportunity to share our ideas, um, especially the vision of an international committee. As you said, um, we have members from all over the world that represents museums in different categories, art museum, history museum, um, technology museums, science museums, etc. cetera. So um, this, I have to say that this conversation has been extremely important for me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to listen. Um, just because I see so many similarities, but at the same time, so many differences. But one aspect remains uh, very important, and is the definitely value of cultural engineer. That's something that we see apply and we see a huge potential um, in different countries, in different contexts. Um, so um, I just wanna share with you today a few, um, a few ideas. First of all, I would like to um, take a couple of moments just to introduce um, ICEE. Basically, um, um, the International Committee for Exhibition and Change is one of the 33 international committees from ICOM. Um, as, as Juliet said, in our case, our committee, we have members from 52 different countries. So that gave us the opportunity to, um, to have very relevant and very important um, conversation. Next slide, please. So basically, very, very briefly, um, what we do is always focus on providing a platform, providing opportunities to share experiences and to share best practices and challenges related to exhibition exchange, related to touring exhibitions all over the world. So as a strategic goal, ICEE, provide these spaces for conversation, but at the same time, we foster strategic partnerships and collaborations um, with members and inside and outside ICOM. We also maintain an effective communication with all our members and we build leadership capacity um, by providing professional activities to our members. Next slide, please. So now I would like to just mention very briefly um, that our next conference, the 2021 um, ICE annual conference will be held online 
in, um, at the end of September, September 28th, in collaboration with the Art and History Museum in Geneva in Switzerland, as well as Icon Switzerland. With both institutions, we're partnering um, um, just to put our program together. Unfortunately, we couldn't make it um, in person this time, but um, but it's going to be a very interesting opportunity to hear from colleagues from all over the world the experiences in reimagining exhibition exchange. That's the big title. So I encourage you all to scan the code, the uh, QR code that you see um, right now on the screen, and then you will go to the IC website. You can see the call for papers for our next conference. Next slide, please. So um, as we rethink our, our, our work in a, in a post-pandemic scenario, it's very important to take a moment and to understand the impact of these changes and also how can we survive all this, um, this very profound and unprecedented crisis. Next slide, please. So basically, um, what I'm bringing today for you is, is um, a, some ideas about the about taking a look at at the environment for museums, internal and external, and how this unprecedented um, crisis is affecting the work that we all do, and how can we discuss a possible a possible solution. Next slide, please. So basically, um, what I'm what I'm bringing today is um, just a tool from a strategic planning that is called the pestle analysis. That is actually really related. It's very closely related to cultural engineering in a way that takes into consideration the impact of external drivers of change. In this case, we are um, well just mentioning six of them: uh, the uh, political, economical, social technological, legal and ethical, and environmental. All these forces of changes has a profound impact on this crisis in museum in the US as well as other countries based on what we see from ICEE. Next slide, please. So basically the political, economical, and, and social um, changes are here presented. Um, basically political concern to changes of political climate at, of a nation at all levels, economical related to those also factors um, related to drastic reduction in museum budget, et cetera, and social are especially important in this um, during this time because they also um, relate to um, changing demographic, immigration, new audiences, and social justice, among others. Especially um, social justice, one of the most, um, and diversity, and these social changes is one of the, um, one of the drivers that are more affecting uh, the museum field, um, museum field in the United States. Next, please. So then we have the technological, legal, and ethical, and environmental. The technological, of course, the pandemic is bringing a completely new role to technology now because of, I mean, we can do work, exhibition work online, we can send exhibition, we can install, uninstall exhibition virtually, etc. Um, so in terms of legal and ethical, um, there are also very big changes and, and um, including conflict of interest um, for sponsorship, including charitable contribution, and including other issues. For example, in the U.S. right now, there is a big debate about certain um, about a couple of museums. I can actually mention the the Baltimore Museum of Art and the Brooklyn Museum um, selling um, work of art to pay for operational expenses. That is a situation that has generated a very strong public debate in the US and, and many people pointed as a ethical and legal um, um, consequences um, in this aspect. Next slide, please. So the, the pandemic and the need to reinvent 
the way we work is reaffirming some roles for museums, traditional roles, like for example, museums as memory holders, because they basically um, hold for the future generation, the, the patrimony and, and the, the cultural heritage. Um, and also they offer um, called, uh, cultural diplomacy um, opportunities. Those are a little bit more traditional. Um, two new roles that we see that are getting stronger, stronger, and one is related to museums are hub for civil engagement because they play a crucial role in today's global politics climate as a space to um, inspire civil in, um, engagement. And the other one is museums are centuries because they provide safe spaces for conversation to support all these um, all these discussions um, and conversation so what is very interesting that is happening you know, happening um, in the US is that many are talking about two pandemics one the covid pandemic and the other one is the social pandemic because it's um, the US, um, climate is so deeply divided right now in terms of social issues, in terms of um, discussions, that even the director of the African um, Art Museum at the Smithsonian Institution, she publicly referred to the social pandemic as well, just to put into context um, other issues that are definitely affecting um, the exhibition work. Next slide, please. So in this scenario, what realistic practical steps can we take to embrace change? What realistic steps can we take to embrace cultural engineering? How can museums and exhibition professionals, um, what can they do when ex uh, institution and a slow, really a slow to change? So now I would like to mention a couple of um, examples from the US. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And, and the first comment that I would like to make is um, it's a, it's a fundamental difference um, in the public funding for museums in the US compared to Europe, in this case with France. We don't have a minister of culture here. We have federal and state um, agencies that support museums, like the National um, Endowment for the Arts, like the National Endowment for the Humanities, like the Institute of Museum and Library Services. But we don't have the structure of a Minister of Culture. So um, in that sense, um, the civil society, private contribution from individuals um, have been playing a very important role in the income for museums. So here you can see that before the pandemic, we are talking about museums contribute to $50 billion each year to the US economy. And that generates the uh, museum support 726,000 jobs. So this is the scenario before, before the pandemic. So now what we have is in one in one ever third museum will eventually close if they don't receive the, the financial support they need. And this, and then we have all these consequences. So um, this is very interesting for us because in a way, just under, I mean, we need to really rethink how can we articulate all these external drivers of change and see how can we discuss and see how we can come up with a strategy that will minimize the strongest impact in terms of negative consequences from those changes, but at the same time take the, the, the most benefit of the opportunities, like for example, technology, since technology are redefining, um, technology tools are redefining the way we work, that brings a new look into business models because now we can do less in person and we can do more digital. So what can we keep from this technology momentum that will help us in the future to move on? How can we develop new public 
and private partnership. How can we really create an ecosystem that takes into consideration social, economical, technological, environmental drivers of change and put all of them together into a cultural reengineering process? So that's the challenge. Um, but what I can tell you now is that um, things are happening um, in museums all over the world, and especially um, here in the US, that will never happen before. I mean, this is um, this pandemic also, the social pandemic, um, is bringing attention to issues like, for example, we have a two. Uh, chief curators from the um, from museums. One was from the San Francisco Museum of Art, another one from the Guggenheim Museum, that needed to step down from their work because of national protests in terms of racism and discrimination. So we need to create a new ecosystem that will support more democratic and more equal practices that will guarantee a very um, equal working environment, but at the same time, we need to move forward and try to rethink the way we work in exhibitions, making them more sustainable, making them more adapted to the new audiences because the, the crisis is changing the audiences. So we need to understand them more. So. What we see also is um, exhibition with less objects. We see a, a bigger participation of communities um, in curatorial practices. Sometimes even, you know, um, this community partnership are really taking a very big role. Um, we see also a, a strongest focus on museum collections in terms of exhibition content. We see that as well. And we see collaborations, new collaborations, new strategic partnership and alliances with actors, with, uh, with partners that will not necessarily um, museums work in the past. This is just a little bit of what is happening. It's a, it's a huge opportunity to reinvent ourselves. It's, a, it's a, the, the, the right moment to take uh, analysis and see how these drivers of change are impacting our work and see what we can learn from other countries. Um, again, um, because we have different funding models and we have sometimes um, very different um, institutional models, um, everything has to be put into context. But there are certain lesson learned that we can definitely, um, that we can definitely keep. One aspect that I think is working really well in the US is the advocacy and is the power of the advocacy. Through the American Alliance of Museums, um, museum directors, they have the opportunity to go every year to Congress and meet lawmakers and make the case for the institution. So every year, and this is actually the last Tuesday in February of every year, in Washington, D.C., at the Congress, we have at least 300 museum directors from every state in the nation that will go to Capitol and meet with their lawmakers from their own states. But they will meet here in Washington, D.C. And they will provide information about the, the activities and the program that all these museums in each of the states do. They will invite these lawmakers to their institution when, when they are back home. They will develop a relationship with these lawmakers just to make sure that they understand the importance of the work the museums um, do. So this, this is a... a, a um, this is a very good example. And actually, I think the advocacy day has been in place for at least 15 years. And since I live in Washington, DC, I, I go every year. So I'm seeing how this event, how this connection, how this platform, how, this, the, how the power of advocacy has been growing 
and growing and growing and getting stronger here um, here in the U.S. And that actually um, goes with that concept of cultural gen- uh, engineering in a way that we need to figure out how to put all the changes into place, how to put all the different variables into one strategy. So, um, so again, the, the community is more involved um, exhibitions are more sustainable. That's what I'm seeing. Um, it's, a, it's a really difficult moment. We are rethinking business models. We are rethinking the way we work. We are rethinking agreements. We're rethinking many, many things. But if one skill is needed for cultural uh, engineering, I will say is flexibility and adaptability without the understanding of the big picture and how we translate the impact of the big picture into our daily work, we will be lost because we will be completely isolated working inside the walls of a museum without a clear reference of how our work is impacting by what is happening outside the walls. So that's... um, that's in general um, what I have for you. So um, I will be um, more than happy to participate later on on the debate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Antonio. Thank you for all this information that you've just given us, but also for just refocusing the question uh, for the social aspects of museums with precise language. You're saying very precise things about what you're doing in very specific ways. And thank you very much, Ellen. I'll pass over to you for you to introduce Anais. Thank you very much. Antonio talked about flexibility and adaptability that we need to demonstrate more than ever. And I think that Anais, on, from this point of view, who is our next speaker with the creation of Culture Connect, but also her experience in England at the British Museum and the VNA, she would also be able to share about all the work that she has done and talk us about the, the current situation and her is does her analysis agree with Antonio's or not? Thank you, Anais, for being with us now. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. And thank you very much, Hélène, Juliette and Charles for this invitation to take part this evening. I'm delighted to be here because this question of the cost of, of, of museum intelligence is something that comes up regularly in my career and it's been a fairly central centre point in my career up until now. As um, Ellen mentioned, I created Culture Con- Connect three years ago. This is a consulting company for the cultural sector. For 15 years before that, I worked across different continents. I worked in Europe, in Asia, in the US. I was also able to move between public sector, private sector positions, moving from the corporate world with airstreaming and then also in cultural institutions in the US, British Museum and V&A in the UK. I was always very interested in the potential transfers between these different worlds in which I was was participating and and interacting with. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is how museums could have a bit more of an entrepreneurial spirit. What is the best practice from business that could be applied to museums in order to help them be the best that they could be? That's what I was always interested in. And that's how I started my first position in, in British Museum was was commercial advisor, which 
at the time in many museums in, in the Louvre, for instance, uh, did, did not develop teams in the way that they do today. So what I'm going to try to do during my short presentation is to share my experience for the development of commercial and sales policy, my know-how and, and museum branding within these two national institutions in the UK, which are the British Museum and the V&A. So one of the points Antonio was talking about the importance of context earlier, and I think it is important to underline that this career and development was within a context where there's the, the marriage of culture and, and society was, uh, was quite natural. So I told you the, the name of my position, commercial officer, I'll explain the content behind that, what my role was in a minute. I would like to quote Sir Henry Fool, who is the founder of the V&A, and at the end of the 19th century was very happy to explain how this museum was part of an economic ecosystem which contributed to the development of design and the English industry. If possible, I'm going to uh, say this in, in English. Is that possible? Can the translators translate my presentation if I speak in, in English? Donc c'est euh, Sir Henry Cole qui euh, parle en fait du musée, qui défend en fait le musée, euh, donc euh, Victoria and Albert Museum, musée de Londres. Sir so Henry Cole was, was talking. The first result of this kind of institution is to make the public anger after object. I think they then go to the china shops and say, we do not like this or that. We have seen something prettier at the South Kensington Museum. And the shopkeeper who knows his own interest repeats that, the manuf that to the manufacturer and the manufacturer instigated by that demand produced this article. Donc, uh, très clairement, en fait, ce, qui, ce que disait uh, Henry Cole, c'est que le musée... What Henry Cole was saying is that the V&A Museum, it was called the South Kensington Museum at the time, it was there to give people the taste and demand for objects. This was a, a time when the Brits were very good in textiles, but were then losing ground to the Germans and the French, and who were adding design to the, to the industrial process. The, the museum here was part of an economic ecosystem. And this mindset is what I found when I started working at the British Museum and the V&A. There's this flexibility and adaptability between these two worlds. So what did this look like? What was the scope of this work? So to go back to the mandate that I received initially from the British Museum as commercial advisor was to create new income streams for the museum. This was not through ticketing. This was not through derived products or philanthropy or publications. So when I saw the roadmap, I thought, well, there's not a lot left. <laughs> How am I going to, to do this? All of the work that I had to carry out was thinking about the museum's advantages and how I could monetize this sector. I'm not going to go into details, but I'll give you an overview of the work. So I was thinking about um, legacy policies, maximizing donation box money, and increasingly there, was, there, were, there were thoughts about expertise, our advantages were our objects, our location, our venue, and the expertise that we have within that. Very quickly, my work started to focus on international traveling programs and exhibitions from the British Museum. There was an exhibition section that was designed with a business model behind it, which was entirely commercial driven. 
And I'll come back to that in a minute with this idea of trying to strike a balance here as well. There's also what we have called cultural diplomacy at play here as well. As Agnès was saying, these two things can exist, coexist together. It's not always simple, but it is possible. So a lot of the monetizing of this expertise takes place through these traveling exhibitions, which is a real source of revenue for many of our museums. The second example that I wanted to give you was an example not from the British Museum, but from the Victoria and Albert Museum, where the roadmap I was given, I had to develop international policy at the museum and its international strategy. I had to think about the specifics of the Victoria and Albert Museum. So it was very good in terms of the development of exhi exhibitions that were very interactive and they developed entrepreneurial data. So along with the colleague at the time, I developed a series of training programs on site in person for museum professionals across the entire world, drawing on the skills, know-how of my museum colleagues. And I packaged that in a way that it became a product that the museum was able to sell. And the third example that I wanted to mention was the development of a major partnership with a Chinese business called China Merchants Group. When I started, the V&A director at the time said, Anais, this is great. We've met these people. I'm sure that there's something we can do here. It's going to be great. You just need to invent what it's going to be. It was incredible, really, to have a clean sheet that I could work on here. This partnership was a combination of consulting, production, and sharing of content, and also promotion of the brand and licensing of the VNA. So, with similar aspects to what could be done with the Louvre at Abu Dhabi um, in a, on a much smaller scale here, I think uh, there's a before and after of the Abu Dhabi as um, was said earlier, but I think also the scale of Abu Dhabi is uh, unique in the history of museums. We wanted to think about how we could collaborate and develop this collaboration so that it could be viable financially. So these projects all had in common the fact that they brought in significant revenue to the institutions where I was working. Mm. And this is a crucial aspect, which was never the full driving force. In the governance of museums, you always have to describe and defend your project. And the question of internal balance, place of, of, of work with the new teams, in light of these new projects, reputation for the trustees and the leaders of these institutions, this was very important and needed to be taken into account. Even though these projects have solid foundations and are based on a commercial business model, they need to have these other dimensions. And I'm sorry because I've not been able to be here throughout the entire evening. I know that it was mentioned in the preparation meeting, there's this aspect of transformation and motivation for teams. These are experiences that go in both directions. It's never just about disseminating something in one direction. I've always been able to defend these projects within these institutions because they helped us to open up to new horizons and uh, opportunity to get to know ourselves better and discover new practices elsewhere. So all of these aspects have always been 
have really underpinned these projects and I would like to focus a little bit now on um, the fact that I, I'm coming from this com com context, of course, where this is very well seen. Um, and in this post COVID world that we live in, post second wave, first wave, etc., there's a lot to talk about here. And in this environment in the UK, after 15 years of a deliberate policy where cultural institutions have been encouraged to think creatively, to have out of the box thinking about how they work, trying to be increasingly financially independent. When you see the results of the crisis now, many of these institution directors in the UK are going back to the French model. You see that the Louvre, I think it's 90 million um, in an annual loss, but no one has been made redundant. Whereas in the major museums in the English speaking world, you've got around 20 to 30 percent um, reduction in workforces. We saw Antonio's figures for the uh, American statistics, which are very striking. I think this is mean. This is meant that we're starting to think about what this means. Perhaps we've gone too far in our policy for commercial sources of revenue. Is it sustainable? And I'd like to come back to something which I've always found important and I've always tried to work on this with um, clients. What I think is more important than ever now is that we need to be very honest in our assessment of the commercial role with regard to the production aspect and the production of cultural added value. In my opinion, it should never become the driver or the reason for being. It has to remain a resource or a tool for museums to do its work. And if I go back now to the example of the partnership in China, the idea and the reason why our trustees at the VNA Museum wanted to pursue this project. What gave it meaning was the great similarity between how this new institution was born, moving from made in China to design in China. This was the same transition that we had, which is at the heart of the story of the VNA. That meant that there was meaning and we were able to generate money for the museum but it was harmoniously integrated into the rest of the museum's activities. We could discover and study the history of design, which is at the heart of what the VNA does. But this is a very innovative way of doing this. There were colleagues on site that were able to talk to and discover stakeholders of change in ways that we hadn't been able to, to do this if we'd have sent our colleagues to temporary missions. So we always need to take this into account holistically. The number one driving force needs to be the creation of cultural added value. So to conclude on the question that we're asking today, does the know-how of museums have a price? And yes, said yes, of course. And uh, other speakers have also said that I totally agree with that point of view. There are conditions under which we can completely think in a commercial way, create a business model that goes beyond public subsidies, regardless of the scale here. And um, I'm sure you can talk about local examples. We'll talk about that later on. You don't have to be a large museum to start in this field. This is one tool that the museum has available. But as um, Hervé uh, Barbaré said, this needs to be done well and under the right conditions. And above all, 
we need to all think individually and collectively about this need we have today to reaffirm the civic and social role of museums and culture. I think there's a real need today to articulate, build the case for the museum as a public cultural good. This creativity that we have and this innovation that we have in how we are a museum should not take over this need that we have to maintain this notion of a museum as a, a common public good to build bonds, to build our societies. So I'd like to finish with an invitation to read a great book called What Money Can't Buy, which is by Michael Sandler, an American philosopher, which really explains how we can lose our way here with this exploration and transformation of market societies, as he calls them. And he explains very clearly how when something's part of the public good, the common good, and we decide to share that with as many people as possible and monetize it, there are limits to the system. I think as for many things, it's about quantities. We need to think differently and imagine new things, but fundamentally we need to remember that culture more today more than ever is central to our society and it needs to remain a channel for rebuilding fractured societies. So though, for those of us pushing forward the commercial dimension, we have this responsibility to know where to uh, set the boundaries so that we do not uh, derive away from our primary mission. Thank you very much, Anais. You said so much there. And I know that any of you, I would like to remind you that any of you can listen to anything that's been said again and this is going to be published. You finished by saying that we are the ones that need to make culture this major instrument for social transformation. Thank you for saying that. You also said something that can really link into what Michel Antoine is going to say. You said that we needed to take into account the effects of cultural engineering, which has an impact on our skills and on our teams internally. And I think that Michel will be able to talk about this a little bit more. Things never happen exactly as we planned. And so I'd just like to present Michel very briefly. So he's been director of exhibitions at Universe Science since 2016. She's in charge of programming exhibitions at the Cité des Sciences. And she will be talking um, about the Cité des Enfants, the children's Cité how these aspects that they've developed have been exported internationally through cultural engineering. It is very enriching for those in-house, but also for those receiving this. So we're expecting a lot um, from your uh, presentation, Michelle. Thank you very much. And if you turn your microphone on, it'll be even better. That's the classic thing to do uh, on visuals, especially at this time in the evening. I was saying uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for this uh, this kind introduction. Um, just to go back over this, universe science is a bit of a uh, a wild name, but it's two important institutions, two scientific cultural um, institutions, uh, the Palais de la Découverte and the Cité des Sciences et de l'Industrie. We have, I'm, I'm talking about the good years, of course, not these last years, but we have 1.2 million uh, visitors 
um, out, outside our exhibition centers um, because we have these events outside of our centers, but these are connected in together. Um, my first reflection, because I'm one of the last to speak, and as you listen to other people, you start to rethink what you're going to say. One of the things is that since the beginning, and as we we heard about this uh, gesture of cultural engineering from Claude Mollard, and the world of culture has really changed and museums have changed. And since I've been asked, what is the impact of, of cultural engineering on the museum? I think I could say that cultural engineering has encouraged the professionalization of museums. And I'd like to um, talk about these different pr master's programs in different universities, um, lessons on finance, um, on these other skills that used to be just for the private sector, but they're now coming into the training of young people who are arriving in museums. And so what I see is that I have applications um, that really would have, I wouldn't have had 10 years ago. People from Sciences Po, from the best um, um, schools of commerce, um, business from the best business schools, because there's a way of operating that they relate to. And cultural engineering has got something to do with that. So this development, has, which has taken 25 years, Universe Science has been um, doing cultural engineering for 25 years, primarily around the Cité des Enfants, the children's aspect. There's, there's some here as a knowledge and a know-how with a specific aspect that this know-how has been tested, has proven by ex the experience of visitors, by reality. So I think one of the big uh, f forms of museums is that they can show concepts that have been proven for the Cité des Enfants, for example, because there are a number of versions, but the, the latest vision, the latest version, which opened in 2006 for the smaller ones and 2009 for the um, older children, we've had 2 million visitors in this area. So when we make available, of course, for a price, but we make available this um, infrastructure to our partners, it's with the experience that we've gained over these years and with all these young visitors. Uh, Cité des Enfants is the cutting edge of what we're doing. We've re re reproduced it 10 times over. There are 10 places in France and in the world, um, in Hong Kong, Macao, Dubai, uh, yeah, um, and Valencia out, outside of France, and also in Strasbourg and other places in France. And we've, we, we have now um, some significant know-how around this whole question. So why are people looking to us? Because we have a product that's really unique. I, I'm, I'm daring to use the word product because we're in this event today together. Of course, people might object to that, but we have a unique product because it's really built with experts, experts on, on, on young, on early age, childhood, uh, artists working with children, and we, we bring them all together around this unique product. Uh, all of the knowledge that we implement in this exhibition is, 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 is comes from a whole range. Sorry. So um, what I wanted to say is since, since then, this product has been copied a great deal. And it's this is something that we're really rather proud about. And because this is the, 
this shows that what we've got is something that's interesting. And that's why we are now completely renewing this offering through the production of temporary exhibitions with uh, t titles like Fragile, a Contrary Metamorphoses. These are area, uh, titles that are more open, that, that leave space for the creativity of children. And we're going to change the Cité des Enfants from within in order to keep offering uh, something that corresponds to the demand. As we heard earlier, there really needs to be real demand. And, and this demand has changed because the world has changed. So uh, more generally in our cultural engineering approach, which is not limited to the Cité des Enfants, is that we present what we do best. So at Univers Science, we're not going to offer engineering services in all domains that you can imagine. That would mean nothing. We really need to focus our efforts where we're really good. Uh, in the introduction, we talked about the strategic framework that we need to give ourselves when we do cultural engineering. We need to restrict ourselves to areas where we have recognized e excellence nationally and internationally. Um, this is the, the Cité des Enfants, for example, and also uh, educational uh, media, mediation, uh, which is one of the key aspects of the Palais de la Découverte for many years, and also accessibility, which we've been working on since the opening of the Cité des Sciences and, and de l'Industrie, and then this theme of cinema uh, connected into uh, biology, which is as um, we've had agreements with the um, Cinema Museum in Cannes. So we're wanting to ensure that we really have added value in the, the cultural engineering services that we offer. Why? Because we don't know everything and there are areas where we are consumers of cultural engineering. We are very often uh, drawing on agencies like ABCD, uh, for example, which we've done that for a number, on a number of occasions with the Palais de la Découverte, because there are areas where we don't have the expertise or because we need an external perspective that a cultural engineering agency that can can bring even in areas where we that we where we do know what we're doing and that helps us often to to move forward in terms of the methodology because as Juliet was saying that we developed a, a particular methodology um, we 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 follow the standard uh, cultural engineering models mentioned by Claude Mollard. But what we do that's specific is that there is no dedicated team for cultural engineering. We have a team, of course, that is in charge of prospecting, of contacting customers, of coordinating projects. But it is the whole collective of universal science together that works together and could be involved in any cultural engineering project. So we, we have a, 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 a very great number of experts who could be involved very temporarily as part of a brainstorming when we're developing a concept for adapting the Cité des Enfants, for example. Usually we, that starts with a brainstorming process where we generate a whole load of ideas. When we do a diagnostic at the beginning of a project, we do it in a 360 degree way because we have people in our institution who uh, represent the, all the different uh, functions that will be there in this new infrastructure and this new project we're going to develop. So that, that does this, the counterpart of this is that this is interstitial in the work of each of the of the staff. I think I saw one of my um, colleagues in the audience here. They could 
confirm today that um, sometimes we have to persuade our staff members to take part in these cultural projects because at the same start it's time they're working on other areas which competes uh, for their time but this cross-cutting work and i heard very was very interested in what claude mola was saying on the ima the arab world institute it's very interesting to see this the these counterparts so there's the cross-cutting aspect which contributes a great deal but then we could ask ourselves why are we doing this cultural engineering project we could say well throughout these present all the presentations we've heard today we're asking the question and we're saying that the reason is to have more uh, revenue more of our own resources but is that really what is driving the machine and when you look at the figures it's not so clear we are an institution that has a, a, an important uh, operational cost because of our, our buildings um, but if I say for 2019 we had a turnover generally about 3 million on our cultural engineering projects those 3 million only represent 10.6 percent of our own resources which are uh, which come from ticketing and the renting of our convention space etc and these 3 million only represent about 2 percent of the, our operating receipts our operating income in general so that means that even in an institution where cultural engineering activity is well developed and there is a prospecting towards the public and also to the private sector it remains marginal so we also do it for other reasons and this is where i agree with what was said earlier we do it for almost symbolic reasons for questions linked to image and uh, reputation and um, this might be reputation within uh, commercial projects but when cultural engineering is about promoting your brand outside of your own institution even we don't do branding like uh, some people do we could do that but we're not really e equipped for that in terms of our methods and approach but when we open up the Cité des Enfants in Hong Kong and and the Cité des Sciences, the Cité des Enfants and the Cité des Sciences et l'Industrie is becomes visible um, uh, no, these are perhaps a big marketing project but there's also a reputation area around diplomacy this aspect of where there's no longer a, a financial question but there's this question for development support when we participate in projects and we were um, we were solicited we were solicited for a project that Agnes mentioned um for for, for dev in developing countries and this is something that's symbolic because there is a real exchange a real um enriching process that goes beyond uh, our, 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 our teams and perhaps our, our teams is perhaps this is the the last uh, benefit but not the least one is that our teams our staff are transformed through these cultural engineering processes because of contact with other people because of um, connection with other uh, professions but also the change of posture um, which creates a total transformation a, a decentering so i can see for example the attitudes of our staff with regard to service providers totally changes in terms of their expectations the level of expectations the way they define orders all of that uh, fundamentally modifies uh, their work and the institution really benefits from that so um 
the know-how of museums has a price, um, but there are also a lot of non-monetary benefits to draw from this exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michel. That was really very concrete, very specific. You said uh, a lot of things there. Um, we're always in a bit of a rush in terms of time, which is a shame. There's so many comments in the chat which are really interesting. It would really be good to be able to, to respond to them. I'm now going to hand on over to Laurence Chenot-Dupin. Um, I can't see you in the chat, but you must be there somewhere. Yes, I found you. Good. I think that you are going to talk to us uh, a bit about the aspect of territory. Yes, thank you very much, Juliette. After listening to all of the previous speakers, there are so many ideas that have emerged that I would like to be able to develop. I'm going to be very quick. I'm not going to say that much to you. I'd just like to give you a territorial or local perspective to give you a different point of view. I'm trying not to give you theory, but something that is from my field experience throughout my professional years. What is it being on the ground? I've, I've worked in public museums in small municipalities for around 20 years. I've worked for around 10 years in a high profile cultural institution, La Cité du Vin, City of Wine which has borrowed a lot of aspects from museums and I was able to use what I'd learnt in museums and outside of museums now I work on cultural engineering and support in different forms often alongside agencies that ask me to create ad hoc agencies so I worked in the public sector with private projects and this has been very enriching and i think it's it feeds into a, a lot of what we've said today i think increasing an increasing number of us have this kind of background now which was perhaps inconceivable a few years ago what i'm struck with listening to this is a number of realities on the ground that apply regardless of the scale. We talked about complexity and this isn't just the case for large projects and institutions. I would even say that it is especially true at a territorial local level where museums cannot see themselves as an autonomous institution but they're part of a whole a cultural fabric locally and more broadly they're a part of the local fabric alongside so many other leisure activities services teaching schools etc museums are part of that and need to find their place within the territory i think that this vision is also even stronger since many museums are now no longer just dependent on a municipality, but a group of municipalities. It's less focused now on our heritage, what belongs to us, and this self-centric perception. With this change of scale, it remains a small territorial scale. Nevertheless, there is real reflection from elected officials about the social role of museums its economic role, its role in boosting the attractiveness of the region. 
any change of projects, any new ambitions we would like to do as a museum, or if we're trying to um, boost a museum that's a little bit sleepy, which can happen, unfortunately. This requires multiple skills within a territory, and sometimes this is far removed from the historic job of the institutions. We've observed a real diversification of skills within museums and capacity building and increase in skills in teams over recent years, particularly with the implementation of um, the Territorial Cultural Agency and INP training programs, university training programs in cultural mediation, technical dimensions, anything around cultural development. If I talk about private engineering now that can strengthen these in-house teams, we've got very responsive and open contacts, which was perhaps not the case a few years ago. One thing that's very fascinating and exciting, I think, is that this environment is becoming increasingly standardized with regulatory constraints, legal constraints, management constraints, which are very strong. But at the same time, it's less and less formatted with regard to the content and what we're able or allowed to do with a museum, opening up to a certain form of hybridization, which I find quite interesting. But once again, this requires juggling with different skills in order to create something interesting without, as Anais was saying, losing sight of the the heart, the very heart of a museum's activity and its own identity, which it needs to express through its uses and all of the new uses that we can expect from it. Since we've placed public the public at the heart of, of the museum a few decades ago now, this is something that museums know how to do now. But this has showcased skills around mediation, also services, accessibility. This is something that we've really understood now. But today in the territorial broader environment, we're more open, we can compare ourselves what's happening with our neighbors, what's happening overseas. We're able to take into account other dimensions like tourist flows, competition between different offers to consider the duration of what we're able to show, to have a different insight into rates and pricing as well, and to have a whole range of synergies that could be increasingly strong as well and, and beyond the, the strict cultural framework. That's the diagnosis that I would make um, as an expert on the basis of my experience. We've talked a lot about skills inside museums and how these can support other projects, particularly overseas. But in local areas, the reality is quite different. We can't deny that museum professionals in most institutions are overwhelmed with work. The teams aren't necessarily big enough to face up to, to, to meet the ambitions, the ambitions of elected officials or their own ambitions. And this is a reality. There's a real issue of availability to renovate, create, takes a lot of time. And beyond the technical skills it requires, it needs time. And this is something that I can say on the basis of my experience, for a project to work, it needs to be carried out in a fairly short time frame. 
this is one of the par parameters that's important. Projects that extended over too long a time period sometimes struggle with political changes, meaning that they can be put back, for instance. And for there to be project dynamics, this needs to be maintained. And this is a way of mobilizing teams. I think that there are very few museums, aside from the large institutions that we talked about here, which are real models, role models that can help boost us, but that can also be frustrating for us on the ground uh, locally to follow. Very few museums propose cultural engineering in territorial local museums. There may be some regions better than that, than us here in, in Nouvelle-Aquitaine. What um, a center, cultural center has been doing um, recently in, in the region with the support of the region, the Cité du Vin, the city of wine, that's demand driven, perhaps the Musée de l'Aquitaine as well, the Aquitaine Museum may do a little bit of cultural engineering as well. I know very few museums that are able to do this despite them potentially having skills. On the other hand, I'd just like to specify that this global approach to territories where the economic dimension is taken into account. I think that eco museums were perhaps pioneers in this at a local level. That's something that came to me whilst listening to you and when whilst thinking about it. But on the other hand, museums aren't necessarily producing cultural engineering, but they are consuming it increasingly. This can lead to certain, um, re certain reluctancy among certain professionals, although this is starting to fade now. Projects are generally co-built. And I think that this reluctancy is starting to fade. Another fear that can exist is a loss in value, particularly for private cultural engineering agencies. In the same way that Michel was saying that you can't just reproduce a project in a new territory that it's made to measure, and this is the very heart of the work that we're doing. We don't want to lose the values that we have. We don't want to lose the unique features either with this fear perhaps of standardization and following models. But with very diverse skills, we can be very inventive and design very unique projects that are really tailored to the territory. I'm not going to share the two examples that I had planned. We can do that in the questions if you would like some on the ground examples. But to finish off, I would just like to say that I am convinced that these cultural engineering practices need us to clarify objectives, analyze the environment in detail. Taking a step back when we're doing cultural engineering, we're not necessarily from that region. We don't have any preconceptions. We can analyze the strengths and weaknesses of a territory. It can play a role of shedding light on what's happening for the teams. Sometimes the teams themselves don't see their value. They don't see their strengths and cultural engineering can be like holding up a mirror to them and help them to build on their strengths in order to position themselves. And this is an important point that's determined by 
a unique feature complementarity of what exists locally as well. And a final point, which is not a technical point, but more symbolic, more symbolic. The support of cultural engineering between on the ground technicians and elected officials gives an external perspective and a change of position giving us freedom to speak, to, to give us permission to do something that perhaps an idea we had in the past, but we didn't do, perhaps because of power on the ground, we, we, we couldn't do something. This is a way of getting things on the table, particularly with regard to governance, but also in other points as well. That's my conviction. I believe that these engineering practices are useful because they mix skills, they seek out the best in the public and private sectors in order to create made to measure responses that take into account all of the unique features of each project. I'd like to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurence. All of our speakers have now finished. We know that uh, Christian Autain is going to give us a summary of the day, and that's always very interesting. We do have some time now for debate. Debate is not always very easy on this platform, but we do always ask anybody to send messages to the chat if they would like to. There are a lot of comments rather than questions in the chat. Unfortunately, I cannot read all of that. It would not make sense. It would take too much time, but I think all of you can read this and perhaps the speakers as well. You may be able to give some answers. There are comments about the figures. I don't think that's the, the heart of the debate here today, though. I think that we've discussed so much today. One of the questions is about skills. We've talked, I think everybody's talked about this. Hervé started to talk about this. Well, what are the skills? that could be part of a, a skills transfer within cultural engineering, what skills are needed in order to become a stakeholder of cultural engineering within your museum. And after Michel Antoine's speech presentation, many of you discussed experience feedback that cultural engineering is providing feedback and transforming professionals. We need to anticipate the skills of the future. Do any of you want to answer this question about skills? I know that Anais had already asked to speak. I saw her hand raised. Hervé wanted to say something. I think that there's a, a, a function where I can um, ask you to, to open your microphones if you need to. Another point I would like to say, I really appreciated Antonio Rodriguez's presentation. We've known each other for a long time and I love the way that you speak so concretely about museums. Often we have a bit of a head in the clouds way of talking about some museums. And Antonio talked about two pandemics, the COVID pandemic and the social pandemic. I think that's very strong. Did any of you uh, react to that? There's a lot of questions about who pays, about the risk of 
of, of commercial uh, problems as well. But would anybody like to say anything about skills? Anais? Yes, I'd, I'd like to. Can you hear me? Yes, sorry, I just had a panic because I, I was told that I'm going to run out of battery. My computer's going to run out of battery, so I need to find a solution for that. So, or just while you're sorting that out, I wanted to just come back to this, um, what was said in the speaker just before, which is linked to this idea of skills. I think what's interesting is this work between the professionals of museums and um, cultural engineering teams, because sometimes there is know-how and knowledge, but the packaging um, in order to find out how this should be integrated and what are the business models to, to sell it. These are not always skills that we have internally. And sometimes we see projects and collaborations where we lose a lot of time in, in negotiations that take a long time because we have a lot of difficulty in calibrating what the needs are going to be and how they're going to be integrated into the museum. And I think that's something where I see companies like Culture Connect, we are, are asked for a lot of help around this area because we can help to save time um, and, and, uh, and activate uh, internal knowledge. And on the point that, um, uh, that what was said, we need to anticipate these um, future needs with all these different startups working uh, around museums, cultural institutions, uh, cultural engineering agencies need to work together to develop offerings that are new and innovative and which make it possible to to develop this sharing of know-how in a more professional way. Thank you very much, Anais. Michel Antoine also wanted to say something. Yes, just um, not, not to contradict anything that Anais was saying, but I think we also need to talk about other kinds of skills which are not strictly cultural engineering. I'm talking here about participation, participation with audiences, with uh, local authorities, there's, there's co-creation with audiences. These are methods that we still need to develop, which are essential to respond to the social challenges that Antonio mentioned so clearly. We need to change methods. We need to change what we're going to produce as a cultural offering. But I think that Antonio also raised his hand, and I imagine he might want to say something on this too. Yes, Antonio, um... Antonio, please. Please take, yes, um, take the floor. My comment is related to, to the skills we need. I will say that any skill that will help you to become more aware of any of those forces of change is a skill that should be definitely added because we are all are different. We're coming from different professional backgrounds. So sometimes, I mean, just getting out of your comfort zone and trying to learn new skills in the technological area or in the social area or in the legal and ethical aspect. So any skill that you can take to understand better the impact of these forces of changes is going to be a great benefit. Um, because of the situation in the US, this social pandemic, um, I always said that one of the best skills we can ever have is become more um, involved in emotional intelligence because that involves awareness, involves social skills, involves regulation, involves many areas that will help to understand the profound impact of the social and economical environment in the field of museum. So those are not definitely the traditional skills, but are the skills that can help us to understand how can we survive in such a changing world. Thank you. Merci, Antonio Agnès. Thank you very much, Antonio. Agnès. 
Your microphone's not on, Agnes. Yes. Sorry, I thought I'd turned it on. Yes, on the question of skills and transfer of skills, I'd just like to say that what is really very exciting is that this there is this capacity in cultural engineering and the ability to export our know-how abroad. We also communicate values in terms of democratic and economic and social values and then of course cultural values as as well like we we in the way that we work as antonio said so so well um we work are working to develop a new m museum um which uh, in Dayomi, which is in a historical site which is really very important we're not just developing a cultural venue we're not just um creating Bena, uh, a place for Bena artifacts, which have been restituated to the Beninwa government. Um, but this is also, and, and the, the cultural value of this is listed on the UNESCO list of cultural heritage, but we're also using this cultural experience to communicate um, skills which is going to highlight local craftsmanship so there's a museographic skills economic skills tourist skills and then it's been said in the chat earlier there are dimensions of this museographical issue which are connected into major social issues um, i am uh, responsible uh, for equality diversity and the prevention of discrimination. So we're talking about diversity here between men and women, economic diversity. We want to support them through the transfer of skills in the cultural field for the benefit of our foreign partners. So I think this, this sphere of cultural engineering covers a whole range of issues. Of course, there's an economic and financial aspect, I think, all this is very clear and i'm afraid there's really no reason to to be ashamed of that but of the economic aspect but we also are communicating a whole number of other values thank you Juliette. thank you and and yes um just before i think laurence asked about the the email but perhaps um, Laurence, Laurence asked to speak, I think. Yes, I agree. Any useful skill is good and worthwhile, but not only skills, also models. We can take, um, we can learn from models. I've worked in the city. Duvin, um, we were observa observing when we were in an airport, when a, in, a, um, in a shopping center. We really want to be open uh, to, to get a fresh vision of our infrastructure and to find our place with audiences who are working between all these different models. They have high expectations, they have high level of demand, and we really need to be open in terms of our references. Laure. Yes, I'm just going to add something in here, but everything's in agreement here, really. It's really interesting to hear from Laurence. I've, my career is fairly similar, moving between the private and the public sector and from big institutions. And we're coming back to this first definition of cultural engineering, which is an overall, a global approach. We're bringing together skills from uh, that are linked into the public sector and private sector. And these are really open questions for thinking about the future of what we're doing. I was really uh, struck by what uh, Claude Mollard said at the very beginning, this idea of cultural engineering includes a lot of it, but this this project, this, this area took 10, 20, 30 years to develop. It was uh, 
initially developed in the 1980s and I was wondering what's the concept that we should now start be develop start developing in France which is going to be the future uh, cultural engineering because there are we haven't listed all the different professions involved there are so many different uh, aspects linked into this we we're, we're, we're very good at the kind of the commercial aspect of museums with museum shops, perhaps not as good as the, as the English, but, um, but uh, we, we're good at thinking about what a cultural museum needs to be. We need to think that if we had to invent the cultural engineering for 2030, 2040, what training would we need to put in place? I, I teach uh, on a master's course at Sciences Po on culture, and I teach uh, cultural project management, asking them what a project is, asking what a cultural project is, and helping to think through the aspects of what that is. And then I also have a, a course um, which I teach in English at Science Po in Paris. and. Uh, we have a number of startups that are breaking out of this model where we're asking this question of what cultural engineering of the future is going to be and what will the skills be. Elve, would you have a, a word to say on, on the future? I think you're absolutely right. This last question is really important. What is the skills? What is the intelligence that we need that's going to develop the, 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 these questions? One thing that I really like that I'm really just repeating, cultural engineering mobilizes so many different skills because museums are a complex system. We could imagine that we uh, are involving philosophers who are developing the theories of museums um, and redevelop that which has been developed from 1804, which is really uh, a beginning. We're just in the very conceptual aspect. And then on an another end of the spectrum, when you say, when a, someone in a museum says, I, we welcome school children um you can say to them very good you're going to have 150 children coming in coaches but your toilets need to be designed to uh, to accept and to host 150 children every day and those are the two ends of the spectrum if you like philosophy and these practical issues and in between them we have scenographers and all those different aspects and what we need to know is in all these different fields of activity who is the best in fact museums are so complex that everything uh, linked to human genius can be involved in museums to make a, a complex and subtle uh, model we have to m mobilize teams I think that the team, French team is one of the best in this area. So I'm asking what's the capacity that we have to mobilize projects, whether it's ambitious or not in, ambitious, because there's so many, so much skills that we have within our country and also elsewhere. Cultural engineering has a price but is a project of general interest in order to bring audiences together with works of intellect. And one of the glories of this sector is to say, even if there is a question of price, fundamentally, we are serving the beautiful, serving beauty. We are, have a kind of higher level of activity. We, there is always soul in what we're doing. And this is one of the great aspects of our profession. Thank you, Elve, for this message, which was important to hear. I hope this debate has helped everyone think about this question of cultural engineering and removed the appreh apprehensions, perhaps, for some people. 
and perhaps helped others understand that we were are really talking about a, a real know-how and that this is the most precious uh, object that we have. We've come to the end uh, of our evening a little bit later than we'd, we'd intended. Um, Christian Otta is now going to conclude for us, and I, I recommend that you listen to him because he's very good at uh, stimulating uh, conclusions. Christian, over to you. Good evening, Juliette. Good evening, everybody. Unfortunately, my computer is not, uh, my camera is not working. I keep trying to uh, turn it on, but it's not working. Thank you uh, once again for inviting me to give the conclusion to this uh, ethics debate um, for ICOM on museum ethics. I think it's really a pleasure for me, and it's also a pleasure to take part in these events since it's 9.15 and there's still 72 of us who are still going. So I think many of us have enjoyed this. I've I've been taking part in these evenings for some time and, and giving the conclusions. I think to, today's debate has been rather different than other times, partly because of the theme, but also because of the speakers and what's been said. It was a real mix of speakers who were high-level experts, but also who were fully involved stakeholders, fully engaged in cultural engineering, and who, through the long period in which they've been working in this area, have become um, witnesses, important witnesses, to lead the debate tonight. Um, this is a debate that's been built around concepts and tools for thinking, um, which are really linked to culture in France. This is perhaps one of the first time in ICOM debates that our first um, that are that our first speakers, uh, four of them were former uh, graduates of our of our heritage training school, um, which shows that there is a lot of benefits in in our uh, National Administration Training School. Um, I'd like to develop uh, this theme in three aspects and giving a bit of historic aspect, a uh, look at the uh, cultural engineering, and finally uh, resuming what's been said, and then finally looking forwards uh, myself by just uh, using some of the words that have been used by some of the speakers, jean Evie Lorenzo in particular. In terms of the history of this debate, um, we can see the publication of this very interesting world publication, uh, which does not emphasize the economic aspects of museums. This is the value of what Agnes, Anais Aguirre said is that museums are historically part of an ecosystem, and she she quoted a, a member of the VNA who said that the museums were part of had a role in developing economy, in encouraging uh, supply and demand, and uh, economic transactions. And then if we want to focus in on recent history, on the recent history of contemporary France, I will just uh, come back to what Claude Marat said and his uh, his friend, Jean-Hervé Lorenzo, because they were together and had been part of this um, story that they gave us. If we wanted to focus in, we would come at this time of museum that Pierre Nora talked about in the 
year of commemoration with the creation of the cultural fund and the fundamental experience of the Pompidou Center with the development of methods for managing costs and um, maintaining deadlines for projects, the essential role of the Lang years with the increase of the culture ministry budget, the place given to culture and all the energy that was de developed there, and then these different agencies as we saw, for example, in France, this agency, this France Museum Agency, which is um, devoted to the museum model in France and developing it abroad, but we see other similar examples in other countries, and we can see the development of private agencies devoted to cultural engineering. So the essential role of Fran France Museum which has led to this unique place of Ab Abu Dhabi Louvre, which Hervé Barbaret talked about. And this is the second point I come to, is this has led to a conceptualization of cultural engineering, which was developed by Claude Mollard, and I think applies to almost all the situations that have been mentioned this evening. Cultural engineering is defined as the capacity to bring an optimal solution in terms of quality and cost management and compliance with deadlines in order to supply people asking for it with the best solution if required. So cultural engineering, it develops in an ecosystem, which for us as museums is a very complex ecosystem, as Hervé Barbaret reminded us, because museums are not just a place and works, but much more than that. And we reach the definition of museum other than the icon definition, which is also very interesting. A museum is a narration, a place where a message is um, produced. It's a public uh, creation um, in order, if we pick up what Laurence um, said, it's a connection between a territory and an audience which take places, takes place in a particular place and involves a business model. We can't think of museums today without thinking of the business model that goes with it. Cultural engineering is one of the parameters of this. It is an extremely complex ecosystem. If you compare some of the different perspectives presented this evening for museums, it is a place of transmutation. Museums were initially an object for cultural engineering and it has now become an active player in cultural engineering but it is not an, a sole player in this it works alongside external players through the plurality of experts which all hold partial capacity for cultural engineering in order to bring this together and implement this and create cultural engineering projects often requires professionals that are going to work outside the museum. They're going to sell museums know-how internationally, requires marketing firms to be working alongside them. As well as this ecosystem, within this ecosystem, there is the state, which also plays a role. A number of large institutions and museums can work with cultural engineering professionals, but are raising questions of visibility and consistency within a state for cultural diplomacy and the use of cultural engineering internationally, which is why there are structures such as Agnès Salles within the French Ministry of Culture in order to bring together players nationally, in order to better prospect opportunities internationally, and in also to make sure that the best national players and stakeholders are able to meet specific needs. 
This is an extremely complex ecosystem and throughout the entire evening there has been the theme of the price of cultural uh, uh, of the museum does does it have a price yes of course that is true to a certain extent but many people have highlighted what what's the cost of the price of know-how of museums and how much are we willing to pay cultural engineering in the world of museums is a fundamental point because it helps develop income and their own streams of income and revenue in order to achieve cost efficiency we want to create cultural engineering and everything but we have seen that museum stakeholders looking to develop cultural engineering need to have in-depth reflection on the opportunity of developing certain segments of their activity within cultural engineering certain segments of their know-how and as cultural engineering stakeholders, certain states, if I, if I, if I go back to Anya Sal's speech, are able to identify all museum offers and cultural offers across a territory. That way they can target part of the museum that may be able to carry out cultural engineering. Many of you also identified striking a balance between the internal pressure of cultural engineering on teams and what they could have what benefits could be generated externally the potential stress and pressure needs to be offset many speakers mentioned this michel antoine and others talked about the benefits that this could also have in terms of team building, new members of the team, cross-disciplinary working methods, which are very beneficial. And to a certain extent, this might help them to become more responsive as well. So developing cultural engineering is also about asking ourselves what our strengths are, what we know how to do well, what we do best, and perhaps also saying, what are our weaknesses? What can we still work on? And what might we need to receive in terms of cultural engineering? Once we had identified the different sectors of cultural engineering, the different segments, I would like to go back to Anaïs Aguerre's analysis. Cultural engineering needs to remain a tool. It is not a purpose or an end in itself. We need to be producing cultural value, cultural added value within our institutions. Cultural engineering needs to be within an ethical approach. It needs to participate in the role of reaffirming the social role and ethical role of museums. Limits have been established, particularly in the current context of the pandemic the pandemics that we have been through to refer to Antonio Rodriguez's presentation talking about the virus and also the social pandemic, we can see that develop cannot be limited to just the developing to developing own sources of, of revenue and income but there's there's social difficulties that our uh, institutions are encountering as well particularly when there is extreme or mass redundancy packages as well in the light of the pandemic we may be able to get past that through looking at what cultural engineering brings beyond the economic dimension many speakers mentioned that it is the place of producing internal reflection and that is something important antonio rodriguez and uh, laurence showed that this is important for building social ties and an identity locally 
In an international context, there's competition, not just economically. We're talking here about cultural diplomacy of visibility for states and institutions. And uh, Michel Antoine showed this, that within cultural engineering, yes, there are benefits and not just economic profit. That can sometimes be a marginal benefit. There are symbolic benefits, cultural benefits and non-market benefits. And now to go back to the example that um, we heard from Anya Sal about Benin, there's a tr transfer of values and we hope through cultural cooperation that there is a form of intercultural dialogue. I'm going to finish briefly by talking about the future. At the start, we talked a lot about this with Jean Hervé. Lorenzi, who was talking about three stages of future development. Firstly, in the short term, which is the impact of recovery plans, which we've seen until now. And then the second, which is a scoop that uh, you've received this evening, hot off the press at this ICOM evening, there's probably going to be a second recovery plan that may not be called that ICOM mentioned a date in November and the cultural sector should be able to request and demand support and as we saw in the first recovery plan we're going to need the second recovery plan if we want to achieve our objectives and then thirdly there's this two to three year plan which is perhaps a little bit uncertain perhaps more pessimistic as well the time will come when the economy will stop growing um, and uh, bouncing back and we may have a more difficult period. And then the mid to long term time frame, which Mr. Lorenzi mentions um, in, in the book that he was promoting as well, which is thinking that COVID was an accelerator of the economic history of the world and certain major trends that were already present means that not all people are going to recover in the same way technology is increasing but productivity is decreasing population aging is accelerating and these are issues that we need to monitor and on the basis of these three structural fundamental elements we're going to need to think about cultural engineering of the future in the light of that and museums have their role to play within that thank you once again for this excellent and very interesting evening and for allowing me to participate thank you very much christian for your brilliant and stimulating summary I would just like to finish off by thanking everybody who took part in the evening. Thank you very much to the interpreters who have worked longer than planned. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to Joy Michel and the colleague, other colleague who have been taking notes to allow us to publish these debates quickly with a trans a transcription which is so faithful to what has said and i'm always surprised at that thank you very much for being here thank you to Anclud maurice our general director icom and to the technical team here still managing the recording of our debates the debates have been recorded and will be on the ICOM France YouTube tomorrow or shortly after that and will be published in a few weeks. You can keep up with all of that on the ICOM France website. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Thank you very much to the participants that have stayed until 20 to 10 French time. There are fewer people than previously, but I think you've been 
very faithful to the density of this debate and it will definitely be memorable and has its place in ICOM's debates. Thank you very much. Goodbye.